All right. So when you mute everyone, you uh, mute yourself as well. That's always good. I no, saw that. Saw that. that was so <laughs> good. <laughs> That's classic. <laughs> so let that be a lesson to us all. Don't power move and mute everyone before you start because you mute yourself. Um, so welcome to Teach Me 4. Uh, we've run, I personally run three of these in, on the trot now. Uh, lots of other people run theirs as well. Uh, but basically, we've got some very clever people lined up to share with us. And I'm going to share my screen real quick to show up so I can kind of show you the sort of thing a teach me involves. And then I'll have some open so I couldn't help myself. Um, and then we'll kick on. Uh, we'll hear from Keith. So basically this event was organized by Keith and myself. Uh, it was actually Keith's idea to present at a democracy conference that was to be run by Stuart Riddle. Obviously the events that occurred changed that somewhat. And so we're doing everything online nowadays uh, for better or for worse. So just briefly, as people trickle in, uh, we are on Indigenous land uh, and without actually naming any places because we're all on in different places around the world, uh, I'll just pause to say that uh, recognise Elders past, present and emerging and any Indigenous people who are with us at the moment. So what I realised is that last time around I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, so I'm Stephen Kohler. If you see as I'm speaking, a Cambodian and Australian flag behind me. That's because I do some work with teachers across borders Australia. And I'm really excited about flip learning and instructional video and also educational research. And I've spent most of today watching uh, Khmer, Cambodian uh, instructional videos from colleagues of mine in Cambodia. So that's sort of made my day, as it were. So in case you've never been to a teach meet, firstly, welcome. Uh, secondly, a teach meet is short presentations. Importantly, equal weight is given to all voices. It's sector blind and inclusive. And if you want to jump on with us, uh, there are a number of different ways you can engage. Uh, Teach me, it's sort of our, uh, a Twitter-centric concept. So if you want to use the hashtags TM4 and Teach me Mel, that would be good. Um, and also, obviously, we're live on YouTube, so you can be making use of the live chat there. So if you want to introduce yourselves, that would be lovely. I can see lots of names I know. Mary, Alex, Sharon, hello, hello. Melissa Messenger. Um, don't know if that's an actual person's name or not, but anyway, <laughs> there are people there. Uh, if you want to maybe introduce yourself, say where you're from, the whole point of this is normally a networking event, but because we are on the internet, that becomes a little bit harder. So if you want to introduce yourself, that would be great. Uh, if you have a question for one of the people speaking, uh, I'm not going to call them panelists because they're all just educators and we're all together in this one. Hello from Perth. Hello, hello. Uh, if you want to tag at Mr. Colbert's Teaching, that's the channel you're on now. That sort of makes it pop up a little bit more clearly and we'll be able to sort of direct those questions to the people speaking. Uh, we're not planning to uh, have questions at the end, but we'll mostly do it via text if people are willing. If you're on Twitter, all these people are as well. Uh, I'll, I'll just pause to say ultimately that if you go into the YouTube description for this video, there's a big long description with all of everyone's uh, Twitter handles, I guess they're called, and all the information you need, even sort of references to documents and articles that people have written and will talk about. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there, uh, the run sheet, the order, what people will be talking about, so you can use that to go back and sort of reference things as you go. These are the topics, and I'm not going to sort of stay with this for too long. But again, this is in the description, so I'm going to fly through it. So I'm just going to do some opening remarks. I'm not really sure what's going to follow from here. And so I thought I'd try and set some sort of a tone. But without knowing what will follow, that's pretty tricky to do. So uh, this is from an article that Anna Dabrowski uh, shared with me recently. Uh, according to the OECD, the teaching profession is valued by society. So the number of teachers who believe that society values them across the OECD nations is at 26%. So what we're talking about is relatively Australian specific, but I think it's a broader sort of topic and Australia wide as well. As the topic is teacher bashing, it seems sort of, it would be remiss of me, I think, to not talk about the fact that teachers and principals are actually being assaulted at numbers that are pretty concerning ultimately. Um, like, you know, more than 40% of principals reported being a victim of physical violence in 2019. 
Uh, to me, look, uh, I'm a real big uh, follower of academic research, but I think for some things there's like, you know, useful sort of bellwethers, and I think this is one. Uh, if you're talking about teacher status and uh, teachers and principals are being actually assaulted by members of the public, that's probably a pretty good sign that maybe teacher status isn't where you would like it to be. Uh, this is from Maury Mulhearns. I'm uh, not really sure how to pronounce his last name. Uh, I love this quote from a paper that he wrote recently, or probably a while ago now, to be honest. And he said a, a quote that I liked, if we forget history, we're only a convulsive twitch to today's media output. That output is false, bad, and works to blot, blot out every day, yesterday's reality. The struggle is always the same. The ultimate goal is always the same. But the currents, the cast, the emphases, the disguises change. So to me, what really jumped out is, you know, a convulsive twitch to today's media output really hit me in the heart um, with our use of uh, social media and all those sort of things. I know I personally am pretty quick to jump on a, uh, the most recent uh, clickbaity title that mentions teachers and in some way bashes us. So to me, a convulsive twitch is something that I would feel personally myself. Uh, I think, to be honest, part of the issue is teachers ourselves. And I don't say that as anyone other than a teacher, but I think the phrase I'm just a teacher sort of sums up a fair bit of the way that the kind of low status of teachers has been inculcated into our own very being. So I'll leave that as open as that. And then just to talk about briefly teacher representation. So I think there's a big debate around teachers and who we would like to represent us and who does represent us. Uh, you know, you think sort of every time there's a Q&A panel, teachers are up in arms by the teachers or lack of teachers that are chosen. I think um, events like this are important for the simple fact that there are teachers and educators, academics, leaders, whatever you want to call them. We've got a whole bunch of different people here representing themselves. Uh, I think it's as long as there are teachers represented on whatever, whatever that thing is, uh, be it a panel, a council, you know, a reference group, whatever you want to call it, as long as you've got teachers, then I'm all for that. And now I'm going to pause briefly and unshare my screen so you can see my face momentarily. Uh, what a relief after looking at my terribly designed slides that are literally just white uh, with clear text underneath. But essentially, that's us. We're here sharing equal voices, teachers, educators, and other clever people discussing. I know all the people that are joining us live are also clever people, so I'm not going to suggest any distinction between those two. So if you have any long, you know, long form or short form thoughts that you'd like to share with us, the live chat or on Twitter would be the place. And uh, we'll do our best to directly respond to your thoughts and questions there. So I'm going to hand over to Keith, who is going to do it without slides, which is an impressive work. So Keith, if you will. All right. Hello. This is really exciting for me, but I, I must admit that I have had just, uh, I, I finally understand what it's like to be that girl that goes to the party and sees someone else wearing that dress, because some of those statistics that Stephen just shared with you, I was going to share with you, but that's okay. We should have been maybe a little bit better prepared. Anyway, so as Steve said, this came out of the second summit um, on education for democracy, which was meant to be uh, at USQ very shortly. Uh, and, and Stephen and I said, you know what? We want to talk about the way that teachers are presented in the media and are, are presented by parents and, and just the status of teachers, not just in Australia, but across the world. Um, and of course, you know, the pandemic happened. So Stephen and I said, you know what, let's do it differently. Let's take it online because that's something that we're all experts in now. Am I right? Um, and, and the beauty of it is suddenly we, we, we have an audience and we have participants from all over Australia and perhaps even globally, we've got people listening to us. So that's that's pretty exciting. And the other thing that was strange for me, um, I've, I've organised a few teach meets in my time, um, but it was weird to organise a teach meet about teacher bashing um, and suddenly to be received so much, well, not so much, but to receive hate mail about this possible topic. I've never heard of, of organisers of teach meets um, being, uh, I wouldn't say abused, I don't think that's right. But to have to, to, to have their professionalism called into account for the sake of organising a teach meet to discuss this particular topic, and I think that is is central to one of the things that we're going to talk about. It, it's also central to the challenges 
that we are facing as a society, but as the profession of educators as well. Um, I think we're being increasingly blamed uh, for, for many of society's ills. Um, and also seem to be a solution to those ills. So there's this weird dynamic going on. Um, you know, we have to teach about domestic violence and how to prevent it. We have to teach about um, peace education. We have to teach about driving education. We have to teach about pool safety. We have to teach about well-being. And it is all happening at a time when it feels like there is less and less resourcing available for schools and early childhood centres. Uh, so, so there is this really strange dynamic going on. But what I do want to say is that that responsibility that, that lies in the hands of us all as teachers and educators is not necessarily a thing. To me, it highlights the centrality of teachers to community, to civil society, to our world. Uh, we are agents of a powerful change. And as Julie and so many others have spoken about, education and obviously that means teachers, are central to the functioning of a dem democratic state. Uh, it's in the Alice Springs Declaration. It was in the Melbourne Declaration before that and all the other ones before that. Education is central to the development of an active and informed citizenry. Um, and, and I want to be clear, I'm not suggesting that there aren't problems with education in Australia. I think there are. But I do not accept the narrative that it's because teachers are unintelligent, though I've heard that said about them, or lazy, I've heard that said about them as well, or uncommitted, I've heard that said about them as well. In all my years of teaching, I have not ever met a teacher who didn't care deeply about the children that were in front of him or her in that classroom and wanted them to succeed. So why the bashing? I think it's because we're an easy target. Everyone's been to school, right? Uh, and, and I know that, you know, when, when you're frustrated and when you're angry, you look for easy targets. And teachers often present themselves as martyrs. Yes, of course we'll do that. We have to do it. I think the work done by teachers across Australia over the, the COVID period has just been extraordinary. And I don't think they've been treated with the respect they deserve because of that work. You know, there are teachers in New South Wales who managed to transform their whole curriculum and, and take it all online in the space of a week or two. Most of them worked through their school holidays to do it. And then once that happened, schools seemed to, oh, the government seemed to rush people back into schools, which forced teachers to re-transform it all again, again, in the space of about a week. And teachers just did it with barely a voice of complaining. And, and I think that just shows the capabilities of teachers that are out there. So that's kind of why I want to have this teach me. I think it's time to stop putting up with this, this bashing and it's time to marshal our forces. And the reason why I wanted to have a teach me is because there is so much good stuff out there. There are people out there who are going to talk to you tonight who have been strong voices already for the profession. They've started Twitter chats. They've started uh, groups and written books and done podcasts. I think their ideas are brilliant and inspirational. You can tell how inspired I am. Uh, and what I want to do is amplify those ideas. So you might hear some things and think, you know what, I'm going to go and try that in my school, in my diocese, in my district. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, what we get out of this is a like-minded community of people who are willing to promote the profession of teachers to the next level. So let's raise that 26% that Stephen talked about and get it up there to be like 90%. All right. I'm looking forward to it. Back to you, Stephen. All righty. Uh, so what do I say after that? Uh, first off, we've got David Zinger. Is that how I pronounce it? I, always, I wouldn't even to ask that. Like the burger. All right. Beautiful. Take it away. <laughs> Hang on. Next one. Good. Just get getting the right place. Hang on. Try it you again. had it and then you just close it. Yeah, I'll just try again. Sure. 
Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, and welcome. So, uh, I'm the founder of the Public Education Network on Facebook. I'm an advocate for public education and a general troublemaker. Uh, Keith mentioned that teachers are fundamentally are fundamental to a functioning democracy, and I couldn't agree more. But what I want to talk about tonight is actually what do teachers think about democracy, and this is some of the findings from a three-year study uh, on, it's not going to work, yeah, um, sorry, go back, three-year study funded by the Australian Research Council. Uh, basically, I looked at a number of questions and I, I've done this around the world and I've done this with pre-service teachers with uh, teacher educators and teachers. And we fundamentally ask all the same questions. What is a democratic society? Is your country a democratic society? Why, why not? Is the United States democratic? From your perspective, is the education system in which you're educated democratic? Are elections important to democracy? Do you feel you're actively engaged in democracy? Should teachers strive to promote a sense of democracy in this, with their students? And what are you doing to promote democracy among students? I'm only going to focus on a few of those important questions tonight, but let me just say from the outset that every country in the world where uh, the Global Doing Democracy Research Project, which I helped found and run, uh, asked the question, is the USA democratic? Uh, every, every participant to a person actually said no, except for the people in the United States. And that's an interesting uh, observation. So when we asked teachers what do they think democracy is, the majority talked about voting as the voice of the people, that active engagement in democracies, about staying up to date with current affairs and political issues. And this is important because teachers have a, uh, they are seen as being ultra left, being radical, out in the streets protesting all the time. But what we see from the majority of teachers' views is that they have a very, very, what I call thin view of democracy, that fair and, and free elections are all the, the essential part of a democracy. However, the minority of teachers, a very few, thought that uh, democracy is about the recognition of universal human rights, about equality for all people, that power is actually vested in the people, and that a government is powered by people to promote equality and social justice. And finally, that uh, democracy provides equality for all citizens of a country uh, in terms of social systems within the community. So did our teachers believe that our country is democratic? Well, 20, only 20% believe that Australia is very democratic. It's a very telling uh, statement given their views about democracy being quite thin. Uh, these are some of the statements that teachers made. The top 1% of population has a disproportionate influence and power over government. Some people have equal opportunities, but not many. Indigenous people and refugees don't have the same opportunities for support, so it is not equal and therefore not democratic. Uh, others said, we live in a pseudo-democracy, even though we get to vote and have a say, it doesn't go far and it's not really taken on board by politicians as they have their own agenda. So what are the implications of this? Well, the shallow or thin views of teachers in terms of what causes systemic inequalities plays a key role in keeping in place social inequalities inside and outside our primary and secondary education classrooms. Our teachers' shallow views of what causes social inequality works to actually foster a thin view of democracy. Schools are essential for democracy. The Canadian philosopher John Ralston Saul argues that any society that educates more than 10% of its children in private schools can no longer call itself a democracy. He says public education is a simile for civilized democracy, that public education is the primary foundation in any civilized democracy. And finally, any weakening of universal public education can only be a weekly of our democracy, and we see that on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you.
Right. Yeah, thank you, David. Short and that's, sweet. That's the most impressive thing. Amazing. <laughs> Love it. Um, yeah, I was just incredible. I would only add, I don't know, a weakening, a weakening of teacher self concept is a weakening of democracy. I don't know, but maybe that's a stretch. Amen. <laughs> um, next up, we've got Alex Wharton uh, talking about respecting teacher professional judgment. So, Alex, if you got it. Newly father, let's go. Okay. Well, good evening, colleagues. And so fantastic to see you here virtually. And um, yeah, just I'm so excited. So I'm going to get into the topic I uh, present tonight, which is called respecting teacher professional judgment. And I'll unpack what that means. And I, I'm being an English teacher. Um, I'm, a, I'm an English teacher and, and um, yeah, really passionate about teaching, particularly secondary and middle school students um, in a really small country town in rural New South Wales called Canada. If ever I'm um, passing through about six hours drive off west of Sydney, please um, call in and say hello. So I thought I'd start off by talking about this, this topic with the idea of respect, right? And I wonder what comes to mind when we talk about respect. For me, it was R-E-S-E-C-T. -E and, of course, my mind went back to that um, really classic song from the 1960s, uh, which, of course, Aretha Franklin was so uh, famous for, for uh, putting into the mainstream. But Aretha Franklin's version was actually a second version. And the original version of the song was actually sung by a man, written by a man as well, uh, who actually was talking about demanding respect from the woman in his life life because he went out and had a job and, and worked um he demanded that respect and so when Aretha Franklin puts a voice to it and changes some of the lyrics for the second version what she's actually done is is command respect uh, for a different way and a different purpose than what was originally intended with that song and I really want us to be thinking about this idea of of commanding respect that we deserve as teachers and as educational professionals so if you'll indulge me uh, please forgive me what we want mm, is teacher professional judgment. Mm. And what we need mm, is to take out the profession. Mm. And all we're asking is for a little respect when we do our thing. When we do our thing. R E S P E C T. These are the, this is the acronym I'm going to use to unpack the topic together. So I thought I'd start by um, talking about the letter R, thinking about results. And I wanted to ask to think about, have we lost track of what it means to teach our students? You know, the topic of results really affects our ability to work and be professionals, and there's such increased uh, focus and pressure scrutiny uh, on this topic, and in particular the elephant in our room, in our classroom of standardised testing, where I and my colleagues feel pulled away from teaching and forced towards testing. And I ask, where is the quality of teaching when there's such pressure and focus on that R word, results? RE, evidence. Teachers know their students and how they learn. We know that from our, our professional teaching standards, of course. And teachers are the primary source of informal data in the students' learning. And so I think for we as teachers who know so many things about the students in our care, that actually goes beyond, that evidence goes beyond the mean number and numeric value. And so I think for teachers to have great confidence and for um, other stakeholders in education to respect that, e, that evidence that teachers have in their own professional judgment um, is really, really important. Um, R-E-S, the nature of being scrutinised. Isn't that such a fantastic word? When we talk about being scrutinised, uh, we as teachers, we're really talking about trustworthiness and reliability of, of teacher professional judgment and how I actually feel that continues to be um, scrutinised even now and kind of feeling like we're under a microscope um, for myself in my own classroom as well as in the profession. It just places so much unnecessary pressure on, on what's already a really challenging and demanding job. Um, if, we, if we think about what scrutin, um, scrutinising is and kind of looks like Professor Chris Davidson from UNSW um, talks about the idea of trustworthiness um, it becomes more from the process of expressing disagreements, justifying opinions and validating them than from immediate consensus. And the idea of, of actually wrestling with colleagues over, over teacher professional judgment, whatever that looks like, whether it's a student direct experience or more broader issues that affect us as teacher um, professionals, but having that voice and not um, feeling like everything we do is going to be examined and the fear of it making a front page of a newspaper or a media um, or being on the project for, for the wrong thing, perhaps. 
um, R-E-S-P. Let's swap um, the politics, the P word for pedagogy. If we think about kind of the, the nature of political pressure for all our different states and territories, um, we really want to remove politics from the education equation, don't we? Any time um, any state or territory has seen a massive curriculum and assessment reform, it's been a direct result of government intervention. And we want to kind of review that continuum of school-based curriculum development um, to today's departments of school education and, and you know, to what extent this is actually a demand and a, and a need. Of course, we want to be preparing our students, but um, to what extent do we do that with the nature of kind of political input that continues to overcrowd our curriculum? Uh, it's not only that the teachers' work is going to have significantly intensified, uh, but it's, it's intensified in a period and context of political volatility, and we want to recognise that. Um, swap the politics for pedagogy. R-E-S-P-E, everyone. Our colleagues here, uh, everyone um, is, is interested in this particular topic of teacher professional judgment and because it does affect everyone. Um, in, like think about the different stakeholders of, of professional associations, of unions, of school groups, of parent communities. Teacher professional judgment is not just the role of the teacher, um, but all of us um, as educational stakeholders are working together at universities and uh, tertiary institutions for our pre-service teachers and so on. And to really, I think, to advocate and support and facilitate and um, be the voice uh, where we don't have the strength to be. I know for me today, after my sixth period day at school, with no bathroom break and all I wanted to do was lunch, I wanted someone to be a voice for me in that situation. And I think just as a profession, we must be supporting each other. I'm not, I'm so quick to, to look inward and perhaps um, you know, look for opportunities to, to um, get perhaps critique and be that uh, voice of, of challenge. Um, R-E-S-P-E-C, you can, you can tell I'm heading towards the end now. And I love the image of a cornerstone. I'm no architect. In fact, I'm actually um, very numerically challenged with my, with my numeracy. But a cornerstone is kind of that piece that holds things together, right? And I think teacher professional judgment is the cornerstone to any educational reform. Um, teacher professional judgment puts learners and teachers at the centre of assessment uh, process. And we want to have this at our forefront for us as teachers, as educators, uh, as leaders, as it affects our pre-service teachers. Um, I know Steffi's talking about that a little bit later. Um, preserved teachers in their role and of course the next generation um, significantly in their working conditions is affected by what happens now with regards to teacher um, professional teacher judgment. R-E-S-B-E-C-T, trust. Uh, all teams work and survive on trust. I mean, trust is so, so important to our school communities, and we've just seen that even in active, as Keith mentioned, in the COVID situation and context. So why would teaching be any different if teams and, and schools survive and thrive on trust? And I think schools and teachers, we need to be granted a high, high degree of trust and autonomy in our design, our implementation, our timing of learning, um, and that's ultimately going to lead to stronger professional judgment. And so I think really emphasising that nature of trust. So, colleagues, in conclusion, um, if we think about uh, teachers' professional in judge, uh, teachers professional judgment and how that kind of uh, interacts with all aspects of, of, of our society, um, I want to finish by thinking R-E-S-P-E-C-T. You found out what it means to me. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, teacher professional judgment. Please, 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 please. please. <laughs> Alex, that's amazing. Um, I feel like I understand why you were nervous, especially nervous for this one, having uh, presented all across the the place. That was very really impressive. Uh, and just yeah, the uh, the video conferencing software gave us even a little bit of auto tune at the end there. Uh, so I just also ask for a. Obviously, uh, Australian internet isn't the best. In fact, it's 58th in the world for average speeds, and uh, only 88% of the Australian population has the internet. So, uh, you know, we're doing the best we can based on that speed and such. Uh, but hey, who told me to rant? I did. <laughs> All right, so Steffi's up next. Uh, she's going to palate cleanse for us, I hope, uh, and talk about new teachers and being welcomed into the new teacher tribe, which is something that we desperately need, I feel. Steffi. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm feeling the pressure to sing right now, but I'm not going to do that to you. Uh, round of applause, online clap for uh, 
Alex, he's super brave for doing that. <laughs> um, so my name is Steffi Salazar and I'm an assistant principal and instructional coach at an awesome public school in Sydney. Um, I'm passionate about inspiring growth in education, in particular by supporting the many brilliant new teachers who we welcome to our profession every year. Now, through my career, I've heard things like, Steffi, you seem to care about things that other people don't really care about, or referring to beginning teacher time, new teachers don't need more time off class, they need to be in the classroom with their kids. Or more commonly, we did it tough, so should they. Now, I understand where these people are coming from, but when nearly half of our new teachers are leaving within the first five years of teaching, clearly something is not working. There are great things happening in terms of supporting new teachers across Australia, but so also some not so great things, sadly leaving many of our new teachers feeling isolated and too overwhelmed to cope. So today I want to share with you what works in my context at my school and hopefully if any teachers and all school leaders are watching and feel even a little bit intrigued, I would love to have a chat with you. Hello and welcome to the New Teacher Tribe. This is what I say over the phone when we are fortunate enough to have a new staff member coming to our school. I let them know that I'm available if they have any questions and when they arrive, they will be welcomed with open arms to our new teacher tribe family. I instantly sense the relief of our new teachers. Now my goal for the new teacher tribe initiative is that all new teachers, teachers feel supported, encouraged and empowered. I'm cheating, I know I don't have slides. <laughs> they feel like and know that they belong because they are part of making important decisions about their teaching and students' journeys. They're engaged in learning guided by their own inquiry and so experience greater success within themselves and with their students. This whole journey started when I was a pre-service teacher in my penultimate year and I was seeking an understanding about what my future teaching career uh, would look like. I founded the Education Society with some of my friends. I started hashtag PST chat, a, chat, a Twitter chat dedicated to supporting pre-service teachers all around the world. And I was fortunate enough to meet Matt Esterman, who first helped me facilitate my first Teach Me with presenters um, like Cam and Alex, which is really cool um, that I'm presenting here with them again tonight. So viewing and participating in Teach Meets like these, and dare I say the more important Teach Eats, gave me the belief that I could, I could do what these inspiring educators are doing at their schools with teachers that I work with and with my students. As I moved forward in my career, I was fortunate to receive a lot of support. Of course, there were definite obstacles, but I was able to overcome them because of my mentors and because I had a strong support network surrounding me, including my professional learning network online. In my early years, I naturally gravitated towards pre-service and casual teachers at my school, always happy to brainstorm lesson ideas and discuss different uh, ways to hook students into the learning. And after a few years, my principal asked if I wanted to be the school's first instructional coach, where I would work primarily in partnership with new teachers. Now, one key thing I have learned is that without democratic leadership, the opportunity to do the things we do would not exist. So I'd love to give a special shout out to my principal, Leonie Black, for modeling democratic leadership and supporting me in leading initiatives like the New Teacher Tribe. The Edu Changemakers in Melbourne were also instrumental in providing me with a platform to establish the New Teacher Tribe, giving me a stage to challenge hundreds of educators' biases about new teachers. And I asked them to think, what if we treated new teachers as leaders? They even booked half a pub for me and trusted me to run a workshop for new teachers who came from all around Australia. So what does a new teacher tribe look like at my school? It's a democracy. We have workshops led by different staff members with varying experience, but with buckets of passion, sharing their expertise in areas such as programming, assessment, EALD strategies. We even are lucky to have a teacher who's completing their PhD at the moment in teacher wellbeing, and we were able to use her research um, and her knowledge to role play with our new teachers, challenging scenarios that we commonly face with parents, uh, even challenging students and also other staff members. We're able to do that in a safe space. We also have uh, lots of free events such as marking parties, teach meets um, and conferences. 
So a key point here is that what the new teacher tribe looks like is different every year because it is really guided by the new teachers, their ideas and their feedback. So it's constantly evolving and getting stronger. Now, part of our new teacher tribe is the choice of being part of our instructional coaching program. And through this program, we are able to really explore and become aware of our own biases towards other teachers, parents, students, and also their cultures. Collectively, we build an understanding and negotiate teaching strategy options to nerd out on and experiment with. And with the understanding we gain about our teaching, we reflect and then decide and commit to our next actions together. We work together to ensure that we are always focusing on our students first. And this is a photo, a screenshot from um, a video I recorded. This is what it looks like when you achieve a coaching goal together for the students in a class. So what are the democratic pr practices I believe are fostered by the new teacher tribe? Collaboration and mutual support rather than competition. Empowerment to make positive change in each other's and our students' lives. Modeling and truly believing in an equal partnership approach where we actively seek and take on feedback from each other to be better educators and respect for the worth and dignity of each other. Now, I'm restricted in what I can achieve alone, and I truly believe in what David Zinger, like the burger, says in fostering, fostering a thicker democracy at school that is reflective, critical, participatory, tolerant, and non-hierarchical. So if you are interested in starting a new teacher tribe at your school, please get in touch uh, with me on Twitter. I would love if someone from the Department of Education took on this idea of supporting schools in setting up new teacher tribes so that more of our new teachers feel encouraged and empowered. So let's do this thing. Thank you. Well said, nice work. All right. Respect again, guys. We're we're repeating ourselves. Come on, it's no good. Uh, beautiful work. Uh, yeah, I, it's such an important role to really uh, bring teachers into sort of a position of strength and, as you said, leadership. Uh, I think that's a really great way of shifting the paradigm and getting them a little bit uh, more confident in the work that they do. Too often if they're treated poorly, they come in and don't stay, as you say, 40 50%, depending on whose statistic you, statistics you look at in the first five years. Uh, Cameron, so democracy and education seems like a good title to go with the conference. So talk to us. Thanks for just bringing my slides up. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm a high school history teacher from Sydney and looking forward to speaking with you. So it will come as no great surprise that democracy is currently facing a massive performance crisis. This slide is fairly well known now, the percentage of people who say it's not essential to live in a democracy. In those numbers and the direction of, those, of the graph there absolutely terrifies me. And this is at a time as well that living standards are flattened, ethnic supremacy around the world is being challenged, and social media is empowering fringe movements. Churchill put it nicely, but we need to consider this in the context that Western democracies at the moment are freer and safer than they have ever been. As a historian, I can tell you that I'm scared that liberal democracy might be nothing but a historical blip in the, the timeline of history. We know that democracy is fragile and there's a huge perception at the moment that democracies are being run by selfish elites. History can warn. Most of us have never faced starvation. Most of us have never had to fight in a war. But history is full of examples that the stability that we face is actually temporary. Fascism is more of a threat now than it has ever been since World War II. And Australia is not immune. Current threats to democracy in Australia might include apathy around politics. More directly, if you've looked at uh, Clive Hamilton's book, uh, Silent Invasion, it's a, a wonderful depiction of the rise of Chinese soft power. We could talk about decline in press freedom ongoing issues around race and identity in our country, or the rise of the techno lords. Wonderful book written by Stanford history professor, professor Timothy Snyder. It's more of a pamphlet than a book. And I would argue here that it takes us practice to become a good citizen. Democracy requires active work. And now is the time that we need to do what Hannah Arendt called on us to do as citizens, and that is to stop and think. 
in uh, Timothy Snyder's book, he outlines 20 principles that are the warning signs of tyranny. I mean, they're all relevant and they're all important, but I'm particularly drawn to a few at the moment. Number 17, be alert to words like extremism and terrorism. And just today, I'm drawn back to number six, be wary of paramilitaries. Making the jump here into teaching and learning. There's a wonderful uh, handout you can find online, freely available, called Teaching and Learning in the Age of Trump. It's a couple of years old now, but its points stand clearly. That after Trump's election in the US, bullying, polarization and incivility rose markedly in US schools. Particularly, it was found that in largely white schools, they suddenly became a lot more hostile for minorities. Now, the rosy bit at the end of the, the tunnel is that when school leaders actually addressed this and did something about it, uh, behaviour significantly could improve. But when school leaders did not act, student behaviour grew uh, dramatically worse. Now, tying into what David Zinger said earlier, I did some of my own really serious research into this by asking my year nine class. I'd been invited to participate in a democracy and education workshop and I was invited to uh, bring some quotes from my students. So I asked my year nine history students, how is school preparing you to live in a democracy? And this quote from Sam is fairly typical of what a lot of my students had to say. You know, it was about accepting that things don't go your way all the time. You need to share, you need to collaborate, uh, need to work across differences. But then there were some others. Right, our teachers don't help us live in a democracy. We don't have one at school, it's a dictatorship. Now keep in mind that this is from a boy who has not yet studied the impact of the Nazi regime in the 1930s and 40s. But nevertheless, it made me stop for a moment. And this, teachers protect us too much, too much spoon feeding. And this comes to the points that I wanna make about teaching and learning. I believe that curriculum delivery in its current form isn't good for democracy. Just when our students are most ready to talk about being a citizen, they're actually preparing for exams. We go into meltdown every year about PISA results and ATAR results, bureaucratic regulation. We have mechanistic accountabilities, a huge climate of competition, numeric data overrule everything that we do as teachers. There's over-testing and as Andy, Andy Hargrave says, we're living through an epidemic of anxiety. Andrea Schleicher from the OECD puts it pretty brutally. He describes Australian teachers as interchangeable widgets, merely implanting prefabricated knowledge. So if we're serious about democracy, my central point is that democracy is about how we teach. It's not about cramming syllabus dot points and shoveling masses of content into students. I know in universities, professors jealously guard their academic freedom. It seems to be a, a concept that we've largely lost in K-12 schools. I'd like to see more discussion around the concept of curriculum disobedience. What are we going to refuse to teach? The medical profession is very clear about their professional ethics. The Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. Wonder what education would look like if we adopted something similar. And who speaks for us? The Australian College of Educators has largely collapsed due to falling subscriptions. The Australian Council for Educational Leaders has been undermined by, undermined by marketing and business deals. Um, often we expect more from our unions. It's almost as though we're waiting for Superman. So what can teachers do at this critical moment in history? First thing I'd say is the importance of doing what we're doing right now, and that is building networks, cross-sectorial networks. We can collaborate. We can collaborate uh, across sectors in our state. We can collaborate nationally, but most importantly, we can cl collaborate globally. We can create a shared professional identity. It's our responsibility to do that. And we can engage the disengaged, those who don't wanna be involved in the conversation. So three key points. At this moment in time, this crucial moment in time, this pandemic is a wake up call for us, perhaps a catalyst. How do we learn quickly? How do we learn fast? Our central learning challenge is now helping people cope with a faster rate of change. We've seen right around the world, in Australia over the last two months, that schools have become startups. They act quickly, they iterate. Getting rid of that trope of schools being unchanging factory models of education forever. In relation to teaching and learning, my mentor, Tina Blythe, the best teacher I've ever had, says that teaching is fundamentally a creative act. 
The work we do with our students is our art, and there's no one who can tell us how to make that art. So it's by flexing our creative knowledge worker muscles that we challenge the concept of teacher batching. And finally, I was privileged last year to be involved in the production of a wonderful journal, a wonderful book by the name of Flip the System Australia with Deb Nedelitsky and John Andrews. It was a book, it was a movement about teacher agency, about professionalism and democracy. And within that, our argument was that teachers are activists and education is a political act. So at this moment, when we live in filter bubbles and echo chambers, I'd like us to recognise that as teachers, we are experts in creating safe spaces for our students. And we need to become better at elevating the voices of the marginalised and the silenced. In the US, the hashtag at the moment is to be silent, is to be complicit. It's never been more important for us as educators to engage in public debate. That's how we challenge teacher bashing. And that's how we protect democracy for our generation. Thanks. Well said, well said. Um, yeah, without Flip the System Australia, I don't think any of what we're doing right now happens. That really uh, was one of the books that kind of got me from uh, just teaching a class and clocking off at the end of the day to kind of uh, giving up many nights of sleep to do other things such as what we're doing on a Monday night at 8.46 p.m. Uh, and coming together and collaborating. So thank you very much, Cameron. Uh, and that leads really well into Jemina Colber, who I might know well. And she's going to jump off your presentation and talk about uh, the role of democracy and getting students to do the very things you were speaking about. So, Jemmy, to you. Great. Can you hear me? Of course. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, Awesome. Um, just before I start, I would also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners on the land that I'm on tonight, um, which is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I, um, I see them as the first teachers, thinkers and speakers on this land. Um, just to introduce myself, this is my first time doing a teach meet. Um, I, Steve is my husband and so he's finally convinced me to speak. I'm a bit nervous um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, later in my presentation. Um, but what my job is at the moment, I've been teaching high school English and media studies for about 13 years now. Um, I teach at an inner city high school in Melbourne where I'm also a leader. So currently I'm the school's literacy learning specialist. Um, I'm also going to be co-presenting a network literacy course through the Basto Institute. That's our um, educational leadership um, institute. Fingers crossed it still goes ahead. Thank you very much, COVID. I'm also really heavily involved with the Australian Education Union um, and the Victorian branch, and I have been for a number of years. I'm a state councillor and I currently sit on the branch executive. And because I clearly don't already have enough going on in my life, I'm also the current president of Teachers Across Borders Australia, which you may have um, heard Steve mention at the start as well. Um, so we've been taking groups of Australian educators to Cambodia since 2006 to provide professional development for our Cambodian teacher colleagues um, over there who are doing amazing things in their classrooms right now. So they are, um, they're not having any students come back to their school until COVID has veered from the world. So there's a whole lot of Cambodian teachers, um, uh, I suppose, teaching themselves how to do video lessons for the first time in their career. It's a really exciting time, not just for us, but also for other countries as well. Um, Great. All right, I'm going to start talking about um, my topic tonight. So I believe that democracy in education is really critical and teacher representation is really missing at very at many levels um, of policy and decision making. Um, but I'm just going to take a little bit of a sidestep and I believe that as active educators, we ought to be practising a little of what we preach in our own classrooms. So tonight I'm going to talk about my passion project, about making my classroom a more democratic space through the use of a teaching method called Socratic Circles, which um, you may have heard of and you might be using in your classroom already. Um, just a disclosure, I, um, just to disclose, I'm not a historian, it's not my strength at all. Um, I have done a disservice to many Year 7 humanities classrooms um, by not being a Hums trained teacher. Um, 
Uh, but from what I understand from my own research into Socratic circles is that it comes from the ancient Greek philosopher Socrates, who you've probably heard of, um, and he was really instrumental in a number of ways and especially in education. So he believed that there was a better way of teaching students other than lecturing at them. They don't come to us as empty vessels that we then fill um, and that within each of our students, there's an untapped wealth of knowledge and understanding already. And whilst education can often seem really obsessed with answers, it's actually questioning that drives the human mind in critical thought. And that questioning sometimes doesn't lead to answers and that's okay. Um, and that it'll lead to more questions and more questions. And that in itself is um, an understanding. Another interesting fact about Socrates, other than that he was ugly, as I uh, was reading about him, according to scholars who've been examining paintings and statues of him, to which I say rude, um, and uh, he was actually executed for questioning the status quo of the time. Um, he was forced to drink hemlock, so a poison at the time, so um, fun times in ancient Greece, it seems. But Socrates had some really relevant ideas that, that I believe are to today's education system. And some of my colleagues have already mentioned um, some of these ideas already. I think we teach in a system, especially in secondary, that doesn't really teach students to think and question effectively. I've been a year 12 teacher, year 11 and 12 teacher in English and media for many years now, and I have most definitely fallen into this trap of thinking that we do not have much time. Therefore, if you just listen to the things that I lecture at you, um, then you'll be able to regurgitate them for the SAC, for the SACs, um, for the tests, and then for the exams as well. And then you'll get a good result at the end of the year and my job is done as your teacher. Um, but after a few years of committing fully to using this teaching method, Socratic circles, which I'll explain in a moment, um, the more I realised that I wasn't really preparing my students to participate in a, in a democratic society at all. And I think to participate fully, um, you need to be able to have literacy questioning and speaking and listening. And for most of us, I believe we actually need to be explicitly taught these skills in school. I wasn't. Um, I'm a product of a reasonably traditional schooling. I was a pretty shy kid. Um, presenting is a skill that I've taught myself. I hated presenting in school. I hated it at university. Funnily enough, I've chosen a career which requires me to do it every single working day of my life. And I've obviously gotten a bit better at it now. Um, and it wasn't really until university that I was asked to share my interpretation of an idea or of a text. And my first thought was, what do you mean there's more than one interpretation? I really wasn't taught to think critically and question until I actually got to university. So until I was an adult. And I had some wonderfully passionate teachers in high school. Um, and it was them that made me want to become a media teacher, my own um, senior high school um, media teachers. Being a teacher where I have learnt how to communicate pretty effectively, I have dialogues with hundreds of people every day at school um, and of course I've gotten, good, I've gotten um, a lot better at that now. Then I become a leader and where my voice is listened to more than it's probably been before and I probably still don't speak up as much as others or as much as I feel that I should or I could. And then along comes a principal who's not my current principal, um, he's a couple of principals ago, I think we've had about five and three years, there's a bit of a revolving door at my school at the moment. Um, along comes this principal who I observed in a meeting, in a leadership meeting, he was keeping a little tally of his leaders and how often they contributed. Talk about pressure for whom this does not come naturally. And I share that, they share that story with my students as well. So here's what a Socratic circle looks like. And I've kind of married the work of two US educators, Kelly Gallagher, who's really into reading and writing, um, and Matt Copeland, who um, has written a whole book on Socratic circles. So the basics is students read a text or interact with some kind of an idea prior to the discussion. I then divide the um, group in half the inner and the outer circle. The inner circle sit in a circle facing each other, then there's an outer circle who are then facing the inner circle. It's the inner circle's responsibility to talk about the text for 10 minutes, 
they're given an initiating question from me if they want one and then I don't interrupt them at all. The outer circle is observing the content of the discussion um, as well as they're observing the speaking and listening skills that the students in the inner circle is using and that is the fascinating part of Socratic circles. Um, they've got an observation sheet that they're writing notes on. After 10 minutes, um, the outer circle debriefs on the inner circle. So they problem solve, they provide suggestions for improvement and they set a goal for their own inner circle time. And this is all facilitated by me, but I'm not at all providing them with solutions. And the circle swap, repeat the protocol, we do a reflection and evaluation at the end. The whole protocol probably takes about a double period, that's about 100 minutes at my school. Um, and I organise uh, to do a Socratic circle with my classes maybe once a month or so. And what I love about Socratic circles is that you can adapt this to any area that you teach. So in doing this, I believe I've created a time and a space in my classroom where my students' voice is as important as mine. And I don't think they get that opportunity very often. You know, as educators, I think monologic talk is often what we fall back on in the classroom because we are so time poor. So, you know, the teacher talks in front of the class, they ask a question, a couple of students put their hands up, we hear from them, and then the student summarises or repeats back what they said and then we move on. And that is not how we talk to each other in any other space in life. So this dialogic method, Socratic Circles, gives every single student in my class a voice. So I'm explicitly teaching them the skills of questioning and speaking and listening. And I believe that these are life skills. I'm teaching them that deeper understanding of something is possible without a teacher telling them the answer. And they can come really creative and beautiful understandings and ideas without me interrupting them. That's with a year seven class and a year 12 class. Um, they can get to these ideas without me. And that's what's so exciting about this. My students also love Socratic circle time. So during the recent emergency remote learning, they wanted to trial a Socratic circle, so we did one and then they asked for another. So we did a couple during that time. And for students who've been with me for a year after going through, you know, maybe 12 Socratic circles in the year, they tell me they like speaking in class more, that they feel that they're better at it. They become better at posing questions. They become better readers. Um, they know how to draw quieter classmates into the discussion. They're really conscious of dominating voices and they're really not ashamed to tell someone if they think they're dominating a conversation. Um, and that skill of inclusion, I think, is just such an, such an awesome skill to be teaching um, my students. They know how to, or they feel more comfortable challenging someone else's ideas but do that in a respectful way um, and the biggest thing for me is that they are more confident in speaking and sharing their views with other with others and you know I'm nearly done um, but you know I look at many of the leaders in our country and decision makers and I see their level of confidence you know these are people who are really confident speakers they know how to present and speak in front of groups of people um, it comes naturally to them but many of them have no substance. They've got no ideas or any deep thinking going on behind the facade. And I just think about in my classroom and in all of our classrooms, we have these beautiful deep thinkers um, and I want these students to be full of confidence and to be equipped to enter the adult world, to be able to share their ideas with others, to be able to respectfully or maybe not respectfully challenge the status quo. You know, I want these people to be the ones to make decisions in education and other important areas rather than some of the puppets that we see currently. So that's kind of where I'm at in my journey so far in making my classroom a more democratic space. And I'll be honest, I am still a dictator for most of the time. But, you know, I'm a fun and, fun and friendly one, so maybe that's okay. Maybe I can get away with it. Um, so in conclusion, yes. We need more democracy in education than we currently have. Um, and I, I know many teachers are voiceless when it comes to decisions made about their day to day. And I think that's just unacceptable. Um, it doesn't happen in many industries, but it happens in education. 
But I think that as educators, we also need to be modelling this in our own classrooms um, and giving my students more opportunity to express their own democratic freedoms has yet to backfire on me. And I think it's only made me more confident that I'm on the right path with what I believe that an Australian education should be for students as well as for teachers. Thank you. Beautifully done. From the kindest and funniest di dictator I know. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Thanks. Um, let's throw to Ruth, who is talking about a democratic approach and taking a strength-focused lens on teachers and their work. So, Ruth. Awesome. Thank you, Stephen. Um, my name's Ruth Smith. Um, I'm a teacher at a public school in Queensland, and I also work um, with uh, with um, pre-service teachers at a university in Queensland as well. Um, my interests include teacher professionalism, um, teacher professional learning, identity um, and pedagogy. So this topic is near and dear to my heart. When I first saw the, the topic of this particular teach meet, one of the things that I really wanted to explore was this notion of um, who exactly this teacher is. Who is this teacher that um, the media, that um, public accounts of teachers and teaching um, are bashing in, um, you know, in in all these discourses? It actually comes from the, from the neo through sorry through neoliberalism, and I find it really interesting that they've set up this um, particular view of teachers and then seek to bash it. So this stance, um, which has dominated uh, much of the dialogue in Australia over a number of the, the last decades, is one that's um, about deficits. It's one that's dominated by um, what counts as performance. What is it that we perceive and value in our teachers? Um, and it's often from the point of view of what needs improving. And that's the first dialogue that we hear. So what is it that um, we could bring to this to change this? This construct of teacher that, that um, happens as a result of this stance um, that's characterised by deficits, um, it's actually driven by the need to standardise and quantify what our teachers do, um, in, including their pedagogy. So in effect, what we're doing is um, measuring, sorry, we're valuing what we measure rather than measuring what we value. And what this has resulted in is a kind of uninformed professionalism. It's a direct result of this neoliberal liberal focus on the standardisation, pardon me, the standardisation of teaching and of what counts of learning, but also what it means to be a good teacher. If we standardise and quantify our teachers and their pedagogy, we end up with an end result that doesn't fit the needs of our communities. We do we do have standards and we do need standards, but they aren't the sole arbiter of what counts. We need something that's deeper and we need something that respects the needs and the, um, the and values each and every single individual in there. And that's what a democratic approach to um, pedagogy but and to teachers and teaching can offer us. So a democratic approach offers us an alternative view and one which is more beneficial for our teachers, for our students, for our education system and for our society as a whole. So what I'd like you to do is take off the lens of neoliberalism and put on the lens of democracy and one where we start to see each individual and their strengths rather than the standardised view that um, media would have us and, the pol and politicians would have us to accept. So this one, instead of being characterised and spotlighting deficits, which is in student data or systemic results, Democracy in school actually seeks the strengths of each individual and how harnessing those strengths could actually lead to improvement, which is ultimately um, one, of the one of the goals of neoliberal sorry, neoliberalism, but it tends to be quite self-defeating. So the neoliberal approach, while it seems to value um, effectiveness and efficacy, it fundamentally ignores the capital that we have in our workforce. It fundamentally ignores what is unique and special about each of our teachers, those unique qualities and strengths that we bring to classrooms every day. And ironically, it's those things that our students will remember um, long after the lessons that we've taught have departed. So how exactly do we combat teacher bashing through this approach? Well, firstly, the dialogues within and about our schooling need to change. 
to do this, identifying and capitalizing on our unique strengths um, and those of our teachers is at the core of an approach which values each and every single one of our teachers as individuals. Although the, the neoliberalist approach seeks to, um, well, it purports rather to be about efficiency, the reality is that the systems that they support are perhaps one of the most inefficient of systems. Viewing teachers and teaching through, a, through a, like a neoliberal um, deficit focus, focused lens ignores the assets that our teachers bring to our classrooms, um, to our schools and our systems, and most importantly, to our students and their lives. If these strengths were identified, shared, and mobilized for the enhancement of education, this could result in far greater efficiency and um, efficacy um, for our teachers. So let's talk briefly about um, efficiency. If we're talking about efficiency, we want to be able to, um, as an organization, find and use the assets within our organization before we seek them outside. Each of our teachers have skills, they have knowledges, they have unique experiences which others in the school, not only not only students, but other teachers and other school leaders can learn from. Is it always necessary for us to seek professional development from outside? Or as one of our speakers has brought out, we have we have capital inside our school. What What is that capital? How do we find it, seek it and make use of it? What, um, this, what are the skills that we already have that we can mobilize within our schools? Teacher bashing is actually counterproductive um, and it kind of, actually goes against its own values. If it values efficiency, why, why bash those people through the construct that they've already made? Efficacy is another one. Teacher self-efficacy, as we've seen at the beginning, um, and morale is quite low. Part of the reason for this is if we standardize um, our view of teachers and seek to quantify what they do, they don't feel valued. They don't feel, and me as a teacher as well, I don't feel valued. Um, I don't feel that um, myself and my colleagues, what we bring to the classroom, is um, is able to be brought to the fore. So if we change to a dialogue about strengths, bringing those strengths to the fore and utilizing them um, through an approach which values a much wider skill set than a neoliberal approach, um, we can actually build teacher efficacy um, and value and morale of each of each teacher and their skill set. One of the primary benefits of a strengths-based approach is a dialogue shift. And um, seeking strengths changes the dialogue within a school. So no longer is, is the dialogue about what's wrong, what needs fixing um, in the first instance. It becomes, it becomes firstly about what are the strengths that we can mobilize here? How can we um, interconnect with one another, become interdependent and rely on one another's strengths to help each other out? So if we do that, dialogue shifts within schools can also shift dialogues without outside schools, which can result in um, a dialogue which can challenge um, this one of teacher bashing. What about improvement? Because that's one of the, the cornerstones of a, neoliberal, a neoliberalist um, structure. So although many approaches to BD ask us to um, spotlight our deficits. So for example, if you um, set goals for the following year, often what you do is um, you might identify your strengths at the beginning, but the focus is primarily on deficits, seeking those deficits, looking for professional development to improve those deficits. I would challenge this um, and say that um, the, the greatest improvement actually comes from harnessing our strengths, to work out what those strengths are, to share those strengths with one another and um, to use those strengths to not only improve ourselves, but to improve our teaching and those of our colleagues and then to improve the learning of our students. So um, greater improvement can actually be, be achieved through this strengths-based approach um, and greater professional growth as well. So where do we actually go from here? Um, at the beginning of this Teach Meet, one of our speakers said that democracy is powered by the people. And if that's so, then it's time that what we did is discover and celebrate the strengths of our teachers and mobilize them for the good of our future. We can do that by looking inside ourselves, each of us as teachers, um, what are our strengths um, and thinking about this first reflectively on our in, um, inside ourselves and finding a way to be able to um, share that with others. Look around us. So what are the strengths of the people um, who, is, who we're sitting next to in the staff room and those people who are in our schools? Um, find ways to become, to share these. What can we offer one another? And through becoming interdependent, we can build on these strengths. 
So to challenge this dialogue of teacher bashing, we need to find and value our strengths and those of around us. It's one of the few ways that we can combat this construct of the neoliberal teacher um, and building this through a dialogue of strengths. Thank you. Beautiful work, Anne. It's, it's uh, easy to speak of uh, things that should change without trying to then implicate those changes within oneself. And I say that from my own experience, not some broad sweeping statement. Uh, and I think the way these presentations always seem to flow together is quite surprising, to be honest. So speaking about within oneself, uh, Beck's presentation is teacher bashing from which within, which is something I'm very concerned about. So Beck, over to you. Thanks. I'm, I'm not sure if I um, was clear when I said from within, I'm not specifically talking about within myself. However, some of the things that I refer to may very well do that. Uh, so to introduce myself to all of our viewers, uh, I'm Beck West. I'm in the public system and this is my 18th year of teaching now. Uh, I've been in a variety of small schools, large schools. I've been in a central school, uh, went from classroom teacher to AP, uh, assistant principal. I've had a few stints as the relieving principal and my current position is deputy principal instructional leader at my current school. Uh, and I love it, even with the COVID interruption, which was a bit crazy. I had <laughs> a very interesting time and professional growth throughout that. Uh, some of you that are watching might know me from my YouTube channel, Talk and Chalk, completely not monetized. I don't sell anything. I don't spam anything. I just created it so that teachers could share and collaborate because I believe sharing is caring. So that's why I engage in that platform. And I'm passionate about equity, creativity and innovation, not just for our students, but for our teachers and our communities as well. So the things that I'm talking about tonight uh, are not specifically referring um, it, the school that I'm at or my employer or anything like that. This is just a general broad set of experiences that I've had throughout my career that have led me to this topic today, uh, teacher bashing from within. And I suppose it really stems from my experiences when I was relieving as the school principal and then suddenly getting that different viewpoint about what's going on in schools and, and feeling that very solitary weight once you sit in that chair, even on the very first day, because you are suddenly privy to a lot of sensitive information about your students, your teachers and your community. And you have to keep that confidential while supporting everyone, while knowing that there's people out there that don't understand the reasons why you're creating that, that equity between people that looks like it's, I guess, creating an inequality amongst the, the staff or the students or even amongst the community and what you're doing. And it's really difficult sometimes to be able to um, move forward with achieving those school goals when those things are happening. So there's three different ways that I want to cover uh, teacher bashing from within today. And one is within schools and systems. Second one is across systems. And then the last one is going to be online. So I will do my best to keep it in my time frame. So Steve, jump in and cut me off if I'm going too long. Uh, if I'm looking down, it's just because I've got my notes. I haven't created a presentation today. So let's go straight to within schools, within our schools and systems. So thinking of your school context, you know, things like the corridor gossip, the basic one, teachers, you know, bashing each other out about their lessons or their organisation or what they're doing. Uh, and that's all they're doing. It's just corridor gossip, you know. Uh, really undermining one another and that can go between uh, teachers, between teams, between supervisors, even amongst the executive team um, and undermining each other publicly as well during those administration meetings where people just let everything out at an inappropriate time when that could probably have been more productive if it had been brought up in, you know, uh, a more supportive manner. Um, being reluctant or just outright refusing to adapt to change and I'm sure there was many people, there were many people who, who might have felt this or experienced this as we hit those changes with COVID where people just went, not doing online, sorry, it's not me, not handling it. Whereas you might have the other people in the team that are going, come on guys, we, we really need your support. We really need to do this for each other. How, how do we do this without supporting one another? Um, that that bottom up, top down thing where we think people are above us or people are below us, that that doesn't exist. And, and I don't, I try not to see my teams like that. We're all colleagues that just happen to be in different roles. So I think seeing someone as above or below you is an inherent way that you're kind of teacher bashing. And, and when I say teachers, I, I executives and principals and even our people at state office, corporate office, 
they are educators as well. So that's who I include in that um, that description. Uh, those people who are just unwilling to change throughout the entirety of, of how they contribute to their school, the people that constantly say, no, we used to do it this way, we used to do it this way, don't want to change at all because they're whatever reasons they have. Um, and that can be a way of sort of bashing that person that's trying to bring in something new. So if it is the brand new beginning teacher that says, hey, guys, I think we could do sport differently. Can you imagine having that teacher that's been there who's really experienced that they look up to for 10 years or whatever and they just go, no, nah, not doing it. It's really demeaning. So, you know, those sorts of things can happen. And then there's outright bullying that happens in schools. And it does happen in schools. We can't ignore that. We know that it's there. Uh, and I know that me personally having the code of conduct I saw in the comments before someone said it feels like that's uh, like a noose stopping you from saying anything. But for me as an, ex as an executive, that helps me protect other staff from people engaging in those bullying behaviours. So I really think it depends on how you utilise that document as to how it will support staff. So that can come from different levels. I'm going to jump ahead now to number two, across systems. So when I'm talking about that, that means, you know, going across Catholic, independent, private, homeschooling, distance ed, uh, public education, that's all a systemic thing to me. We are all educators, regardless of which system, which um, style of education that we engage in. So, and those separate systems aren't changing anytime soon. So if we want to be part of that change, that's something that's much higher level up that we can keep advocating for. But we have no reason whatsoever to be bashing our colleagues that are across the systems. Uh, I've got friends that are in the Catholic system, their personal choice, their religion, not mine not going to bash them. We share resources. We still teach the same way. We went to university together. We have the same qualifications. So we're still going to engage in those conversations. We're still going to help each other out when we're stuck uh, pedagogically in the hand with something. All educators, that systemic stuff has to stay away from our relationship with our colleagues. Uh, this even extends to the types of systems that we have. Think uh, early childhood, primary, secondary, those are the big two ones that we seem to talk about all the time. And then we forget TAFE university, our specialist settings like our um, schools for specific purposes, hospital schools, juvenile detention education, those things really come up when we talk of, and compare those different things. Um, and we shouldn't be bashing them as anything less. Um, they aren't less. They're working towards student goals and student outcomes the same way we are in trying to enhance what those kids are going through. Um, and I love the quote from Jesse Jackson, never look down on anybody unless you're helping them up. So there's no point engaging in that kind of talk unless you're willing to contribute and support one another. The worst one I've seen is, is in secondary. So I've worked with a lot of secondary teachers being part of a central school and also being part of the uh, Lachlan Macquarie College Working Party. First thing I can hear is when teachers say, yep, English, maths and other KLAs. I can't think of anything more demeaning than someone in a specialist area being referred to as another KLA. Regardless of all those qualifications, the degrees and everything they go through, just still lumped in that pile as if it's an extra thing. And we can see that now, even with the fact that our main reports that we have to put out, um, you know, we can we can cut curriculum, focus on English and mathematics, and that's all okay. Even though anyone who's been in the system knows that those other KLAs are often our most engaging ones for those students who find it difficult to engage in the high school setting. So I'm just looking at my notes now, <laughs> I'm moving around. Uh, the third one is online, and I think this is the most dangerous and the most disappointing as well to see some of our colleagues engaging in behaviour like this online. Um, it's it's the platform where people just turn into keyboard warriors and they get into blatant teacher bashing. Teachers bashing teachers. It's the most disgusting thing to see. Um, I know I saw on, on media channels when Eddie Wu, uh, you know, with TV and getting his books and um, all the awards that he received and everything, people going on there, well, why not another teacher? Well, celebrate this teacher for crying out loud. There's a teacher in the limelight and everyone's praising it. Let's celebrate it. Don't cry, poor me. You know, let's lift each other up because otherwise we're not going to lift another teacher up into that position later on. Um, there's the trolls on there, the people that just constantly put negative comments on everything that you do, everything. And some of these guys have uh, statements copied and pasted, ready to go. Negative comment, negative comment. Um, just online bullying, that sort of behaviour. This is the kind of behaviour where if we saw our students doing that, 
we would suddenly whip together a cyber safety presentation about online bullying and have a go at our kids. This is the behaviour being engaged in, you know, with our teachers. And it's so demeaning, even down to people, you know, correcting each other's spelling on Facebook. Come on, guys, really? Like that's the behaviour we're going to engage in with our colleagues? I'm the worst one. I use short talk all the time when I'm using those things. Um, and then the general Judgy McJudgesons. I get it myself. I get people saying that I make a ton of money from the talks that I do and the videos I make. I make not a single cent. I'm hoping Stephen will like shout me a coffee one time. I'm next in Melbourne for doing the teach meet or something because there isn't anything else we're getting out of this other than trying to lift each other up and improve things and have a voice and change the system. Um, there were people commenting on the you know types of videos that I share while there's other people really utilizing it. You know, don't insult your fellow teacher. Don't ridicule. If you're going to critique a colleague, it needs to be followed up with guidance and support. There's no point. Otherwise, it is just blatant teacher bashing and it's not going to do us any good. So my last point that I think that I want to get to is just that you need to be prepared that you won't always know the rhyme or reason for something. Um, and sometimes there is a very good reason for that. Sometimes your principal might just be protecting someone. The biggest thing that I gained out of that is the ability to be able to see things in someone else's light and try and put myself in their shoes. I try and play devil's advocate that way. Okay, something that I don't like might be happening, but there may be another reason for it. And that helps me move forward in not bashing my fellow colleagues. And I've been guilty of this stuff before. I'm trying to not do that as I move forward. And hopefully that's the position that we all take moving forward from today. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Beck. Beautifully done. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, social media is, is kind of developed for tribalism and filter bubbles and the, the more times that we put distinctions between ourselves, public, private, early childhood, higher education, TAFE, the more we divide ourselves and anyway, deleterious bad stuff that we don't want to have occur. Thank you, Beck. Uh, we've got Naomi Barnes who is got a PhD in the topic, so it seems like, you know, a relative throw. <laughs> and I am, if you want to introduce yourself and pick up the threads for us. Thank you, Stephen. Um, hi, hi, everyone. My name's Naomi Barnes. Some of you know me and um, some of you don't. So um, I have been around the Twitter traps and the social media teacher um, rounds for a while as a um, as mainly an observer and um, sometimes involved but basically I'm I've, I've never done a teach meet before this is my first one because I'm not actually sure um, I just want to caveat that I'm coming from a position of being an outsider to the education system in a way that I haven't been in schools in the last, for 12 years. And um, so I'm not actually, I, I know from hearing the stories of people who have been, who have talked about the feelings which have coming about with this so-called teacher bashing, of this teacher bashing, but I have not experienced really myself because I haven't been actually a teacher in the time that it's risen. So what I am going to bring to this, what I want to bring to this teach meet is um, a little bit of um, a perspective on democracy and social media and um, teaching education online. I'm a social media researcher uh, from QUT, and I research how education is communicated about on social media. So I'm a communications researcher that works by looking at education communication and how basically how people speak to each other in written format online. So having said that, I want to talk a little bit about trolling. So violence online is toxic. But, and uh, I was really sad to hear that Keith was getting hate mail about this teach meet. And that's the sort of thing which we would class as trolling. But what I want to bring to your attention tonight is that violence online isn't necessarily always trolling. Sometimes it's somebody trying to say something that is really hurting them and they don't know how to articulate it. And I think as you are, as teachers are clever 
people that know know how to teach large numbers of people and how to work rooms. I think it's really important that teachers be aware and be responsible for the reactions to what they might call teacher bashing when it comes from the outside, uh, from outside the inner circle of what it is to be a teacher. So violence online is toxic for democracy. It takes away all the potential for social media to be a place where ideas are shared and rich discussions can be had in a place uh, because people are demobilised by it. Over the 10 years or so I've been watching Education Twitter, I've seen it go from, I've seen it go from a place that was rich with ideas and discussion to a place which um, difficult ideas are not acknowledged and are or are um, called out. And people often try to use this space to say things that they don't quite know yet how to articulate. And sometimes those ideas are controversial. So in so one of the things that social media research has revealed about violence online, like trolling, but also what I want you to think about is the screams of frustration that are coming out about education. People choose not to participate online because of the incivility, and this means that the platforms actually become places of entrepreneurialism rather than democracy because the environment supports the sharing of marketable ideas to the masses rather than thought-provoking and dangerous ones. In fact, there are many women, PhDs, who have been researching dangerous ideas and they have had violence um, directed towards them and it has led to many people not deciding not to research and not to talk about dangerous ideas because of what how things work online but disruption of ideas is necessary for a democracy to flourish and that disruption needs to take sometimes takes form as anger and frustration it cannot always be rational and deliberate like, we, like people in education like. In fact, the expectation that disruptive ideas be rational and deliberate ignores a very long history of activism, which, is not, which, which involves acts which are not rational. The trick is to work out why the anger is there in the first place and to understand where the frustration is coming from and learn something from it. Part of this is to work out whether the violence is trolling or activism. So let's think about this in terms of teacher bashing. So I'm just going to look on my other screen um, because I've written down some notes. Okay, so I understand that it's pretty, I've been a teacher myself, I understand it's pretty hard to hear criticisms of education when you're a teacher. I was never perfect, but I tried really hard every day to be good at my job. It's not nice to spend your whole day being a reflective practitioner, going home knowing you've made mistakes, spending your evening trying to work out in your head how to fix it the next day and then to open up Twitter or a newspaper and see that teachers have yet again been taken to task for some sort of systemic failing. But the controversial and disruptive idea I want to bring to you today, and it has been touched on in a few of, our, the, in, of, in a few of these talks, is that education has been a dickhead in many, many ways. So basically, I know that sometimes it might be easy to say, but state education isn't responsible for rulers on the hands when you don't know your grammar by nuns. Or in my school, I use universal design for learning, so we are inclusive. 
or as Beck has highlighted, the frankly nasty, those kids are good for me. But you can't go around using this royal teacher we because it isn't all teachers that are good. And the education system is violent. So you have to make sure that when you say teachers, you are not you are doing it with a detailed caveat and including who do you mean by teachers? And by doing that, you can't just, and when you use teachers in the broad we, in the broad conceptualization of all teachers, you can't choose to only focus on the good. You have to spend some time thinking about when teacher when education was violent. If we want teach, if we want education to move beyond this point, and with all the things that we're watching going on in the world, we cannot have a selective memory about what education has done and then expect people to trust teachers because people are giving their children over to it if they do not. So education, if we're to move forward, there is no better time than now to attract the wider attention of society and remind people that education, we acknowledge that education has been terrible but also bring an understanding and bring that understanding to conversations we have with people who are unintentionally frustrated, uh, bashing teachers through their frustration and anger because they're holding teacher, a teacher up as a representation of an industry. So education might be the great equaliser and we might need to treat it, it might be integral to democracy, but it, but it, and we might, and we might be, calling out for it to be respected and trusted. And of course we do, but of course we must also not excuse it for allowing the following breaches of trust. The systemic removal of children from their parents, whether to government supported missions for Aboriginal children or religious boarding schools for unwed mothers. The silence about the widespread sexual abuse of children that recognises no sector is immune the thinking that restraining, caging and hitting children are acceptable, acceptable classroom management practices. Bowing to the campaigns that saw education, education about gendered bullying removed from state curriculum in many sectors. The fact that bullying has not ended and is often said to be resolved because there are no further incidents without acknowledging the stickiness of bullying on a child's body. Making parents wait for the principal when they get ushered into the principal's office, when they finally get up the courage to advocate for their child, when the last time that parent was in that room was to be suspended. The denial of access to insert every group and intersection experiencing systemic violence. The fact that some education departments have literally had to make lists for which schools are safe for LGBTIQA teachers that children continue to fail to learn to read and families, teachers and schools do major rhetorical gymnastics to avoid blame rather than getting on with the job of helping a teacher read. So when we say teachers, we need to talk about the things, we need to acknowledge the evil that education has done just as much as the good that education has done. And I think when we have a group of teachers who are so keen to lift education up, we cannot lift education up unless we acknowledge what education has done. So I'm, I'm not going to apologise for bringing the tone down, <laughs> but that's where I'm coming from. I'm coming from somebody who's looking in rather than being in. So thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Naomi. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to throw it straight to Deb without any patter. Uh, Deb, if you're with us, jump in. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, Naomi, what, a, what an act to follow. This is um, it's kind of interesting for me because Naomi and I have um, written together about a number of things, including um, how we came to collaborate on Twitter and, and I suppose her outside perspective versus my inside perspective where I am going to talk about teachers as uh, we uh, and probably bring a bit of a more rose-coloured lens and less of a focus on the 
um, the real problems perhaps in education. But I'm a teacher of over 20 years. Uh, I'm a school leader, a researcher, uh, an editor and author. Uh, I've got a PhD in effective school change. I co-edited, had the absolute pleasure of co-editing Flip the System Australia with Cameron Patterson, who we heard from earlier, and with John Andrews. Uh, and I've written a book on transformational professional learning. So a lot of what Ruth was saying really um, resonated with me. And tonight, I'm gonna explore something that I suppose I've, I'm wondering about, and that is to what extent the COVID-19 pandemic is strengthening or diminishing our profession because I think it's been a bit of a roller coaster for teachers in terms of um, media and external and internal pressures and expectations as we've uh, been experiencing this pandemic in Australia and all over the world. And so for a bit of context, um, you know, there's a real absence often of teacher voice um, on things like media panels, although we're seeing more and more of that on things like Q&A and the drum and so on, uh, advisory boards, Decision making tables, I suppose, is where we're less likely to see a practicing teacher voice. So people, I think Keith was the one who said, you know, everyone's been to school, so everyone's a bit of an expert on education. Uh, and it's about well, who often people are speaking for teachers or about teachers rather than actually to teachers. And we, it's the other thing that's been spoken about tonight is the performativity of our profession. So the idea that we are, schools are often performing in a particular way, and usually that's through uh, as someone said tonight, what we can measure rather than perhaps measuring what we value. So things like standardised testing, uh, NAPLAN and ATAR scores, uh, league tables, and those are all things at the moment because of COVID-19 that are being disrupted. So you've got the cancelling of NAPLAN, you've got universities having to think differently about how they're going to accept students for the 2021 intake. Uh, and so some of those things are being uh, rethought, I suppose. But I do wonder as well about whether we've got some new performativities. So things like virtue signaling on social media, sharing of beautiful graphics of what our remote learning looks like, or look at all the happy people in our school community or our children learning at home with their dogs and their parents. Uh, that in some ways possibly masks some of the things that Naomi's referring to in terms of the messiness and the complexity and the discomfort and in some ways, um, ickiness of what home learning and remote learning and distance learning has been like in terms of exhaustion and workload of teachers as well as um, what home life has felt like in the times that we've had schools open only to essential workers. So I wanted to talk about expertise, voice and action today in terms of teachers. Uh, and I think we do need to think about teachers and I'm going to say teachers in general because I really do believe in our profession and I've never actually been prouder to be a teacher than during this pandemic where I think that locally, globally, nationally, within schools and outside of schools, teachers have really banded together uh, and pivoted at, and um, adjusted their, their work at a really hectic and crazy pace to serve the students in their care. Uh, and there have been teachers that have struggled with that and there have been parents that have struggled uh, with that on the receiving end and there have been students that have struggled with that. But ultimately, I think that the profession has really stepped up to this challenge and that teachers are experts in curriculum, in pedagogy, in teaching and in their students. Uh, it's Dylan William who's written that each teacher has a better idea of what will improve the learning of their students in their classrooms in the context of what they are teaching them than anyone else. And we had some nice high moments uh, on social media. Sorry, excuse my cat. <laughs> um, one of my cats, um, where we had the teachers rock hashtag, we had um, teachers being called heroes and frontline workers, um, but it didn't last long. And then we had our Prime Minister saying that we were child minding, not teaching. Uh, the West Australian Premier said publicly at a press conference that parents should ask for a refund from private schools if they weren't going to return to face-to-face -face learning. Um, as the government had decided it was safe for schools to return. Uh, and a West Australian principal was stood down by the education department after she urged her um, parents to keep their children home if they could for the first week of term, because she wasn't sure at that point if uh, the hygiene and physical distancing measures could be um, implemented. And she's since been reinstated. But those are the kinds of things that happened quite quickly after this sort of little brief moment of, of support for teachers. And reflecting on Cameron's um, presentation about democracy earlier, there's more and more government restrictions, like the COVID-19 crisis has kind of allowed the government to tighten its hold on citizens and on schools and on teachers in many ways. I think that's a really interesting thing to watch. And tech companies too have, have 
um, allowed potentially more surveillance, more data gathering and some kind of worrying things that I probably won't talk about for now. But for me, teacher voice is something that's really important because for me, voice is about um, being valued, being heard um, and being an agent, someone who can enact positive change. And while I know that there are, you know, COVID-19 has, has really shown a spotlight, shone a spotlight on some of the real inequities um, and glaring problems in our education system and in our society, um, I do think that what we need to be thinking about is positive action. And so that's teacher voice in schools through consultation, meaningful feedback and meaningful teacher collaboration around actual change happening uh, and beyond school, things like panels, advisory, advisory boards, um, in the media, uh, podcasts, webinars like this, um, blogs, chapters, you know, not everyone wants to write a book, um, but all things that give our, our voice as a profession credibility, I suppose. But I understand there's also real challenges to us as teachers speaking up and speaking out. Uh, there's the busyness of the work, a full-time teaching load um, is, is a really place and being a school leader is really busy as well. Um, here we are on a, on a Monday night. It's a public holiday here in Western Australia and this is what I'm doing on my public holiday evening before I back to work tomorrow. Um, and it's voluntary unpaid work to speak, to speak out. Uh, there's a risk to ourselves and uh, to our jobs and, and some schools are really um, and systems are, don't allow teachers to speak. And there's also, also an ethical dimension in terms of protecting our students, you know, their stories are not our stories to tell. So there's um, issues with us thinking about whether what it is that we can share publicly uh, and there's always the problem of time. Um, but there's some opportunities as well, I think, and, and as I said, those the school, local, national and, and global collaboration and the, the professional sharing and solidarity and coming together that's happened during this pandemic has really been inspiring to me. Uh, I think some of the professional learning that's been offered, um, the, the global webinars, things like, like, any, like this or anything else where it doesn't matter where you are, it's free and anyone can join, you, you're not limited by um, airfare or... Uh, time or money, or well, time, but or money, um, and so and the, and I've really seen teachers and school leaders as agents because the change has been so hectic, because we've had to think so deeply about the context of our own schools. We've really had to make those decisions and take ownership and be empowered um, to do the right thing for those people that are in our care in our schools. So. What do we do now in terms of voice? Uh, I think there's some interesting challenges from tonight's presenters around what it is that teachers can consider. Um, I think the we're all in this together catch cry uh, is an interesting one because certainly we're not all in this together in the same way and there are inequities. Um, and I think we can ask ourselves a, a few questions. Uh, in Flip the System Australia, we talked about the fact that speaking out as a profession was actually a service to education. And I think we need to ask um, when we're choosing to speak and be silent, Whose voices are we amplifying and elevating? Uh, and what positive action are, could we each be taking? Thank you. Well said, beautifully done. Now, uh, again, conscious of time, we're going to try and throw to Adrian Pickley, if we may. As I appreciate everyone giving up their time and indeed watching this back at a time of their choosing. And uh, thank you, Deb, for speaking on it now. And of course, Adrian, take it away. I can't hear anybody. Oh, we can hear you, uh, which is probably not clearly understood. Um, but we can hear you. So Adrian's topic is the politics of teacher bashing and why it makes no sense. And I would love to pretend I knew what he was going to say. But at the moment, we are waiting. Looks like he is muted, which might not be helping us. Okay, we did test this beforehand for reference but all of a sudden it appears not to be working so what we might do is i can actually mute him from this end adrian you need to unmute yourself 
and he do I don't think he can hear us either. So we might jump to Polly. Polly, if you're happy to jump in for us, uh, we'll troubleshoot in the back end to get Adrian on, perhaps. Yeah. Oh, now you've got me while well, I'm like busily putting dinner away. <laughs> Sit back down and see my filthy house. Um, hello, all. Um, so, I was sort of thinking uh, about the topic, and I was thinking about democracy, obviously. Um, and like a number of us have said, right? So, free, high quality, universal, secular education is the cornerstone, right, of any democracy. It means that we can educate all of our citizens so that they can participate effectively in society and a democratic process. And really without that fundamental right to education and without public education in particular, um, which are the people who service that right, um, society would crumble. And it's us, teachers and our unions and our allies, who do the work of protecting it. We work endlessly to educate and advocate for our kids and for our communities. We are the protectors of democracy. We are like democracy protectors acting superheroes, if you will. And one of the greatest, set, so if we're thinking about like what are the greatest threats to education and therefore to democracy, and no, it's not finding inequity though, that's a big problem. If we're thinking about what the greatest threat to education is, if teachers are the keepers of education, then the greatest threat to education is, and to our students, is whatever is the greatest threat to us. And I think that the greatest threat to us is demoralisation. And unfortunately, demoralisation is really widespread in our profession. I mean, we can see that from, like, the popularity of Gabby Stroud's book, um, Teacher, about uh, demoralisation and burnout. And we can see it in the statistics showing that teachers experience anxiety and depression at significantly higher rates than the general population. So only over half uh, of Australian teachers meet the criteria for an anxiety disorder. Uh, while one in five of us are depressed, um, which is great. And uh, we're also more likely to have alcohol abuse and substance abuse disorders. And I think one of the hardest things for us, right, is that it's not just ourselves that we're trying to protect. We're trying to protect our students too from whatever is the latest educational fad, whatever is the latest standardised test that they've decided, you know, there'll be one in preschool very soon, I'm, I have no doubt, uh, or more, or like 10 in preschool maybe. We're kind of like Harry Potter trying to protect ourselves and Sirius from the Dementors. Like we can do the Patronus charm, but the barrage of Dementors becomes exhausting. Um, and really we need a second one of us to come and help out. Time turners, I'm sure teachers would love them. And all those Dementors I'm sure is why there's always heaps of chocolate in the teacher's staff room. There's two sort of main narratives, right, that I see as our dementors, and the main ones in the media and society that, that people have about teachers. One is a kind of direct attack and the other one is more sort of a tech, a, an attack under the cover of praise. So the direct attack is really obvious. The direct attack is teachers are shit, right? The direct attack is ScoMo calling us childminders. It's being told we need to, you know, do our job, go back to work and pitch in. It's, you know, going to a family barbecue and your uncle or look, even Dave Sharma publicly saying that we work nine to three and have really great holidays. Um, it's the constant rubbish about needing better quality teachers. Like what a load of absolute rubbish. Teachers are great. Like the quality of teachers is fantastic, the ones we have right now. I know that. I am one and you would be hard-pressed to find a better teacher than me. I'm so bloody good. Schools, oh, the other one that's great, schools are failing. Love that. Schools are failing. Teachers are failing. Students are failing. We're lazy, deadbeat losers, those who can't do teach. Now, I need to pause here because I think... The thing with these is we know they're bullshit, right? We see them and we think, oh, God, not this again. I can't. I just can't do it today. I can't keep fighting this fight. And we know they're rubbish, but they still hit. Like it still hurts when we hear it. So I just need a quick reminder. Teachers and schools and students are absolutely not failing, no matter what those stupid test scores say or how they want to read them. And I think we always need to, and I certainly need to keep reminding myself of that because we actually already know it. 
The function of schools and teachers and students is not actually to perform on standardised tests and assessments. Our function is to nurture and to guide and inspire and excite and enthuse. Our function is to uphold democracy by shaping young people who can create and question and explore. And look, I'm a parent. That's what I want too. That's what I want for my kids. And I think that's what most parents want. And we need to be really vigilant that we remember that because the teacher bashing does hurt. And the media loves this narrative, right? I know. <laughs> because it's so good for the clicks. And I know from writing my own columns that it's the clicks, that everybody's everybody loves the clicks. The other thing about this narrative is it directly feeds into the other kind of narrative around teaching which is the martyr teacher, right? This is the direct response to the deadbeat teacher. It's the selfless saints. We work so hard. We are not lazy. We are not shit. We, we do so much you don't even see. We work all the time and we love every single minute of it, every skerrick of work we do. We just love every moment. This one means well, right? This one means really well and it's often written by teachers who are just trying to be honest about what their working life actually looks like and it's in response to that deadbeat teacher it does mean well but it is still really damaging really damaging and it contributes just as much to our demoralization because it says that good teachers who love their students work ungodly hours they work too bloody hard we read it one of two ways, right, as teachers. We either go, oh, good, working a 15-hour day is normal. That's what I do. I'll keep doing it. Or we go, oh, I should really start working 15-hour days because clearly I, this is that's what good teachers do and I am a good teacher. And this is just so, so bad. Like it leads to burnout and to resentment and to those higher levels of anxiety, depression and substance abuse. If the deadbeat teacher narrative is how outsiders bash teachers. The martyr teacher narrative is how we bash ourselves. It's never enough. What we do is never enough. We know that. We know in our work we always could do more. We're never enough. It's never enough. We're so desperate not to be the lazy teacher that we end up totally exploited, overworked, and actually really, really terrible role models for our students. It is terrible modelling to say that we should be that we should be working ourselves into the ground, that that is a model for a decent life. It's not. So here's what I know. I know that I need to re return always to my purpose, right? My purpose is to love and teach and guide and advocate for my students, right? And that includes being a good role model and taking care of myself first and having really strong boundaries about what is work time and what is not work time. And if I'm not provided enough work time to do the work, then there needs to be more resources, more people to do that work, or I need to get paid more and that one's not happening. The other thing I know now is that teaching is not a lifestyle choice. I actually used to legitimately say teaching is not a job, it's a lifestyle choice. Like what a totally effed up thing to say. It's not a lifestyle choice. And careers are long, right? Careers need to be long. We need to understand that teaching careers are often like 40 years plus. You don't need to be a head teacher in three years. Like you don't need to just, oh my God, I got to do it all now because our kids actually need longevity out of us. That's what they need. The other thing I know for certain is that near enough is good enough almost, most of the time, most of the time. I know that giving 100% effort to 100% of things 100% of the time is 100% stupid and 100% a terrible example. And it also gives the teacher bashers exactly what they want. It allows them to exploit us even more and they get double the pound of flesh that they pay for. I suggest we stop giving to them and that we put ourselves and our students and bloody democracy first. So yeah, that's me. Way. <laughs> All right, Polly, so somehow you need to, to get Jane up next. I don't know how you're wangling that, but uh, unless Adrian is about. I am about. Oh, it's very I'm easy. Alive. Hey, mum, come here. Oh, no, there, Adrian, going to go. Oh, Adrian, go ahead. See, I, I'm alive. I don't know. The audio had been working perfectly until about 30 seconds before, and then oh. it just stopped. You know, anyway, I did the traditional thing that we all do, which we've kind of all done during the COVID thing, you know, 
we switched ourselves off and now we're trying to switch ourselves back on again and hopefully everything's working better. Um, but anyway, look, hey, thanks for inviting me to be part of tonight. Um, I, I apologise for my bung eye. I've got an eye infection, so I'm a, I'm a bit wounded tonight. So if, you, if I look dodgy, if I look like I've got a black eye, it's because I've got, is, that's exactly what I've got. I've, I've been listening, I've been listening with great interest. Um, it's always fascinating to hear the perspectives of, of teachers and, uh, and, and principals, uh, particularly about the profession. And I'm not a teacher, but I've obviously had a lot to do with um, education at a government bureaucratic policy um, level. So my perspective is not the perspective of um, a, a teacher or a, or a principal, but it's actually the perspective of the, the group of people who make decisions about, who make system-wide, policy-wide, government-wide decisions about uh, things that affect teachers and, and the reputation of teachers. And I would say this, that governments are very influenced by the views of parents uh, when it comes to education, the views of parents, more than they are influenced by the views of teachers. So when we think about why, when you think about why the governments do what they do, it is more driven by a desire to deliver to parents what their expectations are in education as opposed to school teachers. Not to say they don't take the perspective of school teachers into, into consideration. They do, sometimes to a greater, sometimes to a lesser extent. Uh, everybody would have views about, uh, about governments and what they do in education. But I think it's always important for the, for the teaching profession to remember, particularly when you think, why are governments doing this? It's not the right thing for teachers or it's not the right thing for schools. And that's because what politicians and governments look for more importantly than anything is the perspective of parents. So this whole issue about ac accountability, and I'm, 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 I don't pass any judgments on any particular policies here, but you know, this, thing, this whole thing about accountability now and about you know, why the obsession with PISA testing, why the obsession with NAPLAN testing is because it's actually an obsession of parents. For right or wrong, Parents do want to see, um, they do want to see evidence of improvement and governments are responding to that. As I say, rightly or wrongly, I have my own views about NAPLAN and the negative effects it has on, on actually the very thing that parents want achieved, which is improvement. I think it's doing the opposite. But why don't they get rid of it is because of the backlash from parents. M most teachers want to get rid of it. Most teachers, schools, educators, academics, um, you know, system leaders, anyone involved in education um, wants to get rid of it. The reason governments keep it is because parents like it. Parents like to have that, what they think is an objective measurement of their child's performance, something that they think can be measured uh, every two years reliably, they think, uh, and gives them a, an objective indication of how their children are, are performing. And it goes back to what someone said earlier, the issue about, you know, what about teacher judgment, um, you know, I think par parents have made, are, ma are making a judgment about that and governments are, are responding to that. Um, so that's why governments make, do make decisions that are not in the best interests of teachers. But the other observation I would make, and again, a, a broad observation I would make, is that the teacher bashing, the both the, the literal teacher bashing and the, and, the, and, the, and the verbal bashing that teachers get is because the community has changed in terms of their expectations of not just teachers, but professionals generally. You could say the same thing about referee bashing. You know, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, school sport, people used to, parents used to go and watch as almost disinterested bystanders. Now, for some reason, the stakes are so high that 10-year-old soccer is becoming, you know, a trial match for the Premier League. Um, so... It's a social movement, it's a social change that parents now have such greater expectations on parents being able to actually make my child a, a superstar at school, make my child a, 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 a fantastic um, musician, make my child, uh, make sure my child is a, is a, is a fantastic and su successful sports person. And they're pushing a lot of that blame 
onto the people who do the delivering, which in, in, in this case, we're talking about tonight, um, are, are teachers. Um, so, so I think that's certainly a, a social phenomenon um, uh, that is occurring. It's not helped by the rhetoric of, and some of it's been talked about tonight, the rhetoric of governments when they say that, well, you know, PISA results are going down, schools need to do more, teachers need, need to do more. We know that we know that the actual impact of schools and teachers on students' performance is less than the influences of the things that go on in children's lives outside of school. But there's never any mention in that rhetoric about, well, the responsibility of parents, the responsibility of the community to actually play their role in the education of their children. That they, it's their role to actually teach children about proper, um, proper appropriate behaviour, um, appropriate conduct, um, now, if we wonder why there's more bullying in schools, you only need to listen to talkback radio or buy some of the newspapers in this country to see the way adults behave <laughs> amongst themselves and we wonder why that's happening in schools. So um, I don't think pa parents, teachers should, shouldn't take it personally that there's some, some slight against the teaching profession on its, on its own. It's an unfortunate thing that is, that is happening throughout various professions. I think the, the assaults, et cetera, on paramedics, nursing staff, um, medical staff is, is, has grown as, as, as well. Now, that's not an answer. That's just an observation. I think the answers are, are much more complicated. But I do think part of that answer is better leadership rhetoric around the value of schools, the role that parents play, that it's not all teachers can't do everything, can't deliver every outcome in education for every child. Um, that the role of parents, the role of the community, uh, the role of our society is actually in many ways um, as influential, if not more influential, than what teachers can do um, uh, on any one day in schools. I think that rhetoric would, would help. I mean, I would just make one final observation. I always found it amazing. I always find it amazing that politicians would criticise would criticise teachers just from a statistical point of view, because there are hundreds of... <laughs> there are. Um, 300,000 school teachers across Australia. It's a lot of people to insult by a throwaway line about babysitting and, and the like. Um, you don't have to upset many teachers to lose um, a marginal seat in Australian politics. So I, I, was always, I always wonder why people, um, people do do that in, in politics. But Steve, I'll leave it at that because I know it's getting late. But thanks for inviting me. Thank you, and thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's a very a nice, nice different perspective for us to think about, for sure. I think, yeah, the parents are definitely the key, a big, a big key stakeholder. Uh, Jane, over to you, if you're willing. Yes, of course. <clears throat> um, thanks for asking me. Uh, very interesting listening to everybody. Uh, I'm not a teacher, so I'm not going to presume to talk from that perspective um, what I'm talking about is women's work so I'm looking at teaching from a feminist perspective um, because I think we have to agree even though there's been quite a few male speakers tonight many of whom are teachers that basically uh, teaching is one of the feminized professions Interestingly, Australia has one of the most gender segregated workforces in the world. 60% of us work in an industry dominated by one gender or the other, and this will shock you, but female dominated industries are lower status and lower grade than male dominated industries. Um, teaching, nursing, childcare, aged care, hospitality, retail, tourism, and the arts. Those are all um, among female dominated professions. Uh, you will notice that a great many of them have been extremely badly affected by COVID-19, either by being forced to work uh, at the front line, um, you know, in difficult situations or by losing their jobs altogether. Um, indeed, I believe women have lost their jobs at a much higher rate as a result of COVID and the recession that follows than men have. And that's unusual in most recessions. Women tend to hang on to their jobs, partly because even though they're low paid, they are the kinds of jobs that keep the wheels turning. Women's work is traditionally undervalued. Let's just be straightforward about it. Women are expected to care for others and to serve others as part of their duty. 
in just being female. And we don't value people who merely do their duty. In fact, I would argue that particularly in professions like childcare, um, we resent paying for it at all because we think it should be done for love, not for money. And I think when Polly was talking earlier about the martyr teacher, that's part of that mindset that um, the caring professions and women are seen as the natural carers and workers uh, and nurturers uh, should be done for love and that to get paid for it is almost illegitimate. There's almost something mercenary about that, which is utterly absurd, but unfortunately it has a real effect on women and it has a real effect on women throughout their lives because they tend, particularly in Australia, to congregate in um, caring work. But why does teaching have a particularly, um, you know, kind of the way it's talked about, the way people talk about teachers with such scorn sometimes and disdain? Why teachers in particular? I mean, nurses are poorly paid. They're incredibly overworked. But they are often kind of idealised and venerated. Um, I think that part of that is because nurses do an archetypal female job. They are the nurturers and the carers, um, and their work is non-threatening. It's seen, and they are often working um, in you know sort of support for a doctor. Now, doctors are increasingly women, which is great to see. But by and large, if you ask people to imagine a doctor, they still tend to imagine a man. So we love women when they're working in support of men. Um, we love a female 2IC, Julia Gillard, incredibly popular when she was the um, Deputy Prime Minister. As soon as she was Prime Minister, my God, she was a heinous bitch from hell. Same with Hillary Clinton, most popular woman in America, people forget, when she was Secretary of State to uh, President Obama, 69% approval rating. The minute she decided to run for president, whoa, whoa. She'd sent some emails from a private server. She should have known better. Um, so I think part of the problem is that teaching is a feminised profession and with that goes a lack of respect. Sorry, that, that's just the way it works. Um, and um, the trouble is it's also that teachers are leaders. Teachers take a position of authority in the classroom. They take a position of authority as an expert in educating someone's child. That makes them threatening to pet parents. Um, any parent uh, worth their salt feels insecure in their parenting. We all worry that we're getting things wrong and we're not very good at it and, you know, there isn't any training and we're given this baby and told to go home with it. And I don't know about the rest of you, but when they gave me my first child, Polly, who you just heard from, um, and I was sent home with her, I thought, what, they're going to leave me alone and in charge of her? I don't know what to do. So we all feel insecure in our parenting and we're all terrified that a teacher can see everything we've gotten wrong, that they can tell by our child's behaviour in the classroom, you know, what we've stuffed up. Now, they're probably right. I don't know. You can tell me. I can't tell you. I've never been in that position. And that, therefore, creates defensiveness. And also, if you've got a highly educated, um, articulate um, you know, uh, authoritative woman, that remains problematic in society. A lot of people find that really difficult. We were talking, we we're talking about teacher bashing, and I know that by and large you mean that rhetorically rather than um, literally, but I wrote an article a couple of years ago for the Saturday paper where I actually looked at the percentage of principals who were physically um, threatened and intimidated and on occasions actually, um, you know, physically assaulted. assaulted. And it's much, much more problematic for female principals than male principals. And the male principals I talked to acknowledged that as well and said that when they spoke to their female um, counterparts, they were horrified at the way they were treated, uh, the scorn and disdain with which they, uh, their professional opinion, their authority was regarded. And I think we must not underestimate the effect that a feminised profession which has authority over your child, over your child's education, over the marks they get, the way they're rated, all those things that Adrian was talking about before, um, threatens and offends something that in our society we still hold dear, and that is that women are there to serve and support, not 
to uh, lead and to um, analyze. Uh, now, there's something else that I think is really, really interesting, and that is, uh, and I, when I was researching my book, Accidental Feminists, I, I came across this uh, American teacher, a male teacher, who does a blog about teaching, and it was absolutely fascinating. He talked about how, as a teacher, he felt that he had cracked what he called the female code of honour. And he said that that female code of honour, and I was very interested as a female, I had no idea we had one, but apparently we do, and it's much easier to see when you're not a woman. Um, apparently the female code of honour is that we will do anything to be seen as good nurturers. That you undermine a woman fundamentally when you undermine her um, sense of herself as a nurturer. And what this leads women teachers to do, he said, having observed them for many decades as a colleague, is that they would rather, they, they in a way martyr themselves, go back to what Polly was talking about, rather than directly ask for help. So he said if he needed more equipment, he would go and ask the school system, I need more equipment. He said the women in his American schools would uh, run bake sales and raise the fund themselves to buy the equipment they needed for their students. I think a lot of American schools are even more underfunded than a lot of Australian public schools, obviously. But I found this idea of the female code of honour and that women feel that it's almost incumbent upon them to... Um, sacrifice themselves as so that they can nurture others is another reason that um, teaching along with all the other feminized professions gets so little quarter and is so poorly paid and it's really interesting when you go through a situation like this pandemic well what we've seen is it is those female dominated uh, caring and nurturing professions which are so important to keeping society running. I mean, you are all back doing face-to-face -face teaching right now because nobody else can go to work <laughs> unless you are. Um, you know, we've seen the incredible importance of childcare. We've seen uh, the incredible importance, obviously, of health workers and nurses and parents and all of those people and plus cleaners for goodness sake how important cleaners have been how important retail workers still are all of those are female dominated all of them are low paid all of them are low status all of them are regarded as uh, kind of menial teaching would be the least menial of those but there's a resentment towards that as well so so um, I'm not going to um, rabbit on for much longer. All I would say to you is don't forget you are a feminised profession. Feminised professions universally are less well regarded than those uh, professions female dominated. One quick example of how when a, a profession becomes feminised, its status drops is obviously general practice, practice doctors, general practitioners. Uh, when it was mostly men who were general practitioners, they had very high status. Since it's become female dominated, low status. Feminism and sexism affect everything, including teaching. Thank you for asking me. Thank you very much, Jane. Is Jim steering too loudly beside me? Um, I'm going to throw straight to George because it is 10 12 pm. So, no, George is the demise of teacher agency. Please, how? Go for it. I'll just try and get my slides up. Um, can you see those? Not yet, but I'll give it a beat. Not yet. Okay. All right, got them. We can see your screen. And then slides and then make them beautiful. You can see that. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks, guys, for waiting around. My name's George. I'm a teacher at Box Hill Senior Secondary College. Um, I just wanted to talk about the demise of teacher agency and expertise and perhaps offer some reasons why and how. Uh, one aspect, I know it's a complicated thing, and I don't want to pretend that I understand all of it, but I think one aspect, particularly in the Victorian system, is this notion of evidence-based education and a uh, academic from from England, Adrian Simpson's written quite a bit about it. He reckons this evidence-based education has sort of come in to um, sort of usurp teacher experience and agency. 
Um, but he notes that it's only particular meaning, meanings of evidence, not all, not all evidence is considered. Um, the particular method that seems to die out is this meta, meta analysis, and I really encourage teachers to try and learn a little bit more about it. One of the reasons is, is because it's actually quite a simple st statistical procedure to, uh, to get some of these results. We've all heard of Mr. Hattie, uh, he's the key proponent of this particular method, and just in the last five years or so, I think it's the Education Endowment Foundation from England are starting to do a very similar thing. In Victoria, those teaching in government school would have heard of the 10 hits, the 10 high impact teaching strategies that are defined by Hattie's 2009 Visible Learning Book. Uh, New South Wales have a similar thing called the seven what works best. Uh, really worthwhile for people to look at. My screen is on. <laughs> Now, a reason for the dominance of the particular method of Hattie, I think Scott Eacott wrote in 2007 that Hattie's results just uh, appeal to administrative pursuits, and I think that pretty much summarises it all. He also mentions in his paper that uh, the uncritical acceptance of that particular method and its results is highly problematic. In a, a paper a year later, he calls this visible learning um, dominance, a cult and a tragedy for Australian school leadership. And I'd like uh, most teachers to sort of consider that as, a, as something that's really important. Um, my claims are that I'm on the back of Gert Biesta, who's a giant in Europe. Uh, Biesta basically says that classroom life's way too complicated and there, there isn't any research now that's encapsulated all of that. Uh, in addition to that, the major evidence databases are neither consistent nor con conclusive. We also need open debate about these existing evidence claims. Until that's the case, we really have to rely on teacher experience. So my aim is I've tried to collect the peer reviews to, to critique, uh, in particular, Hattie and the meta-analysis meta technique. Um, although teachers are busy, I, I think this is so important because those evidence databases dominate policy. And until we understand what the method is, um, we're not gonna be able to challenge or, or direct education in a better way. Um, I also, I'm hoping that teachers will read other sorts of studies. I was gonna, Sandy Nicol, I believe is uh, part of the audience tonight. I've just read her PhD study, which is a great study. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other things, but I think I'm running out of time. Um, I'd like to encourage teachers to take on Dylan Williams a phrase that we need to be critical consumers of research and to join other lobby groups that might be able to uh, to rattle the, the cage, so to speak. Uh, an example of a different evidence database that is very different to Hattie is the USA's What Works Clearinghouse. It's a much larger organisation with 20 or more uh, credentialed professors. Their evidence database is very, very different to the meta-analysis technique. So the question is, is why are they so different? Uh, here's an example of perhaps one of the reasons why. Um, a lot of the complexity of the classroom uh, has been summarised into one data point. I'm hoping that we can perhaps turn these ar arrows around and get back to the uh, complexity and nuance of classrooms. Uh, one of the memes I think, or a couple of the memes that I think that have demoralised me at least, and I, I think from other teachers that I've spoken about, our, our friend Mr Hattie again, he continued with the, the claim that statements without evidence are just opinions. And Kevin Collins, who's the CEO of the Education Endowment Foundation, said, if you're not using evidence to inform your decisions, you must be using prejudice. Of course, the evidence that they're referring to is their evidence, not uh, a teacher's experience or classroom evidence. Once again, Mr Hattie said that uh, when teachers make a claim they're having a positive effect on achievement or when a policy improves achievement, this is almost a trivial claim. Virtually everything works. One only needs a pulse and we can improve achievement. I hope we can challenge that. Uh, Dylan Willem did in fact try and challenge that using one of Hattie's uh, feedback studies. This is the study that Hattie claims is the best feed or the most robust feedback study. It's a meta-analysis looking at feedback. And what this study shows is that nearly 38% of feedback does not work. So that challenges Hattie's claim that everything works. And in fact, if you look at a whole bunch of other studies in Hattie's work, you'll see similar patterns. Hattie summarises this whole complex study with one number, 0.38, um, and I'd claim that that does not represent the complexity of the study, and it'd be far more useful to, for teachers to read the actual study itself. Um, 
had he's pulled back from that now, what he said, what he's just recently said and published is most things that a teacher could do in class sort of work. Uh, I've collected over 50 peer reviews and I'm trying to get teachers to help. I've put them in a blog spot that is easily accessible to, uh, to anybody that wants to read and critique it. But there's some examples there. Um, Gerpiesta once again warned of this form of this meta analysis technique. He calls it a form of totalitarianism. I'd encourage you to read Biesta's uh, 2010 paper. Uh, just another example of the way that evidence can be used. Hattie uh, has presented in his 2003 paper that 30, 30, uh, teaches a 30% of the effect on student achievement. He doesn't list any um, the study that he got that from, so it's, it's difficult to check. But that particular thing has taken a life of its own. Many of us have seen this pie chart. Of course, um, I'll skip some of these. Last year, Pazzi Solberg gives different figures. He refers to the American Statistical Association's group of studies in 2005. You can check all of those. They list uh, a teacher effect of 1% to 14%. Whichever one you believe, um, will, I, th I think, is determined by your bias. If you believe the 30%, then you can use that to justify uh, reduced Gonski funding. There's a whole, I'm making a lot of claims here, but I've, I hopefully I'll back them up in my uh, blog site. If you believe the 1% to 14%, that gives you a totally different picture of, of teaching. Other evidence, I think Sandy's here. I, I just saw um, Sandy's PhD last week. Um, it resonated with me quite a lot because she talks about looking at individual teachers' uh, stories. Um, and that conflicts with Hattie. Of course, he doesn't want to listen to teachers' stories. He published that in 2007 or in an interview. Um, and but now he's changing in an interview with Ollie Lovell he is reversed he said now it's not what the numbers say it's now the story so there's lots of contradictions and complexity uh, I've set up an, a, a motion that if AEU Australian Education Union members are in agreement to try and get the AEU to to try and challenge some of these databases I think that's the first step um, there's a couple of other steps and if you want to help with my blog that's the blog spot address uh, thanks for your time thank you very much George and lots of lots of actions to follow through on we're really hoping that something uh, beyond an open discussion comes from this as as well as this discussion has been uh, we're going to throw to Mark Prune who uh, referred to what we're doing right now as a form of radical democracy uh, uh, was pretty radical I believe um, so, Mark, if you want to jump in and take, us, take it from there. You bet. Um, thank you, Stephen. Um, I'd like to thank you, Stephen, for organizing this and for David, uh, who introduced me to this and this fantastic forum and chance to share, and also to the rest of you all. I, I think it's been amazing how things have gone together and fit quite well. It's fantastic when that happens thematically and in terms of inspiration. So it's, it's really an honor. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to start my timer and share my screen. Let me see. Screen. All right. Uh, my title, is, as often happens, <laughs> has uh, evolved a bit, but it is now uh, Centering Teachers and Communities Through Transformative Citizenship Education. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, especially the elders, past, present, and emerging, and the working class people, both indigenous and non-indigenous, who, with their minds, hands, uh, minds and hands produce all of the world's wealth and build and maintain almost all of what we see around us. We would not be able to do the work that we do as intellectual workers on these lands and countries which were never seated in these spaces without them. As a person of U.S. heritage, I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm extremely angry and heartbroken existentially but not in the same way that my sisters, brothers, siblings, and comrades of color are back in the States and around the world. As a white, cis male, economically privileged, adopted Aussie living in what remains of our purposeful social democracy 
My reality is very different. I stand with them. Uh, I'm Mark Prine. I'm with the Faculty of Education at Monash University, but I speak only for myself as a researcher and member of this and other communities. I was a bilingual primary school teacher in Los Angeles for nine years and am completing this month my 24th year as a teacher educator and researcher. This research, which is part of a larger thing called the Citizenship Project, um, has been conducted by myself, my colleague Lisa Carey out of Curtin Uni, and my doctoral colleague uh, Ellie Fumani. In it, we're exploring citizenship identities, that is, the lived citizenships of youth, teachers, the community, and academics in Australia and beyond. We have uh, mainly to this point done interviews and are also conducting kind of a meta-analysis of the literature. Well, we're looking at types of citizenship, and this is what's emerging for us from our really thorough going over of the literature, um, uh, at least one member of whom is here tonight, David Zinger, uh, and many others have written obviously deeply around these topics. But these are the five sort of clusters of types of citizenship uh, we've identified. There's a sixth one as well, which I'll touch on very briefly. But first, the first one. So authoritarian citizenship is really where citizens serve the state and the powerful. And there is a hierarchy of ethnicity and ethnicities. Some citizens in this ranking are seen as less than others. And there's the bizarre notion in the States here, elsewhere, uh, of national exceptionalism for some reason. Next is responsible citizenship. You often hear that we have rights and responsibilities. So it's our job as citizens to fulfill our responsibilities. In this conception of citizenship, one is an official member of a nation state, a society, and holds a passport designating such. So a good example of this is one can donate a can of food to a food drive. Uh, the next category of citizenship is rightful citizenship. So you have responsibilities. If, if, if you fulfill them, then you have rights and you can exercise your rights. Often this involves looking beyond majorities um, and also more than just being a member of a nation state or a society. Um, in this example, one would organize a food drive. And again, we're drawing on many other researchers that have sort of named these types of citizenships and we're looking at these larger clusters. Then there's what we talk about is questioning citizenship. This is where we begin to examine structures and look beyond nation states and begin to critique. Here, for example, we begin asking the question, well, why is there hunger? And then the final category, or penultimate really, uh, of citizenship is one that's transformative citizenship. It's where we examine power, examine systems, and actually attempt to create change. And you can see with some of the labels off to the left there, many of the speakers tonight have talked about this in different kinds of ways. Uh, one of the people at the heart of this, amongst many, is Paulo Freire, who's pictured there. And there's a poster from the Nicaraguan Literacy Campaign, uh, one of many, many international examples where actual change was made. Critical pedagogy that Freire was at the center of and currently exists and continues today is the notion of combining learning with social action. But in the literature, there's an, in interactions with students and others over a couple of years now in data gathering, there's this other type of citizenship that we're still investigating and trying to connect literature to. It's what we're talking about is disconnected citizenship. Some folks are so distracted and exhausted and, uh, and, and their realities are led by these bots and their trolls or they're working so much they can't really practice or get their head around citizenship. So we're talking about this as disconnected citizenship, but we're still theorizing it. 
So connecting this to the Australian curriculum, you know, civics and citizenship within the Australian curriculum is a grades, uh, there's a typo there, a three and four, and then from seven to 10. Otherwise it falls within the larger category of humanities and social sciences. But you can see some of the language around citizenship education from the Australian uh, curriculum. Obligations, national borders, maybe to become informed citizens, belonging in a multicultural society, understanding political choices, having a resilient democracy, a cohesive society. So you can see how these threads connect. So in terms of looking at these categories of citizenship that were kind of calling uh, from the literature, authoritarian, responsible, rightful, questioning, transformative, we see that the Australian curriculum can really fit across many of them, but especially across responsible, rightful, and questioning. But turning to the, the primacy of teachers uh, pedagogical workers and parents and children in the community and fighting back against sort of this teacher bashing and students and parent bashing, a more transformative approach to pedagogy as espoused by Freire and many others here tonight as well, uh, sort of strikes at this more. So I'll present just a couple of examples from our data that speak to how a focus on teachers and communities and understanding citizenship can help push back against some of the things that we've been talking about collectively. So one of our participants who was a teacher and an academic who self-identifies as Chicano, which would be Mexican American, uh, but politicized, he said this, Ernesto said, citizenship is a loaded term, first of all, because on the one hand, you know what it is. We're in it, we just walk through it, but we don't march, we don't raise our voices, we don't question it, we don't fight. We're just, you know, trying to get by. You realize later that it was a big lie. Citizenship requires, oh, that's my timer. Citizenship requires action, responsibility. You need to understand political systems, all those kinds of things. But most people don't see it as an everyday responsibility. I'm gonna, oops, I'm gonna skip this and go to the very last one. This is another bit of, of data, but I'll skip to the very last one. Uh, if you'll indulge me for just a minute more here. Um, my student teachers uh, um, were doing a lesson on what it means to be an Australian, an Australian citizen, especially in connection to indigeneity uh, in a fourth grade classroom. And they were really going deeply. It was way beyond food, fun, and fiestas. It was a deep exploration, not a broad one, but a deep exploration of Australia's European roots, uh, and it's even farther, deeper indigeneity. And this one boy, not this one, but he represents that boy, looked up, looked around at my student teachers, looked at me and said, speaking about the indigenous, huh, they didn't become Aboriginal until we became Australians. They didn't become Aboriginal until we became Australians. Sort of in an indirect way, getting at one of the really fundamental dichotomies about colonization and naming, and it was really moving. And those are my contact details, Mark Prine at Monash. Thank you very much. Beautiful work, Mark, thank you. I'm impressed you set the time up. Uh, <laughs> it's a professional. I went over a bit. I'm just gonna share my so that uh, the, uh, the things that we've got coming up. Um, Teach Meets is uh, very much an alive and well movement. Uh, and so basically uh, the Teachers Education Review podcast uh, have got their own, uh, basically an audio version. So if you've never done a Teach Meet, never been to a Teach Meet, uh, it's a, a perfect time to jump on and record an audio file of what you what we have learnt so far from the period that's obviously just come and been. Uh, I'd highly recommend giving that a go. It's as simple as opening the voice memo option on your phone and sharing what you've learnt so far. That could be from uh, perspectives as diverse as the ones that we've heard tonight, from teaching, from parenting, wh whatever you've got. We'd love to hear what you've learnt so far. Uh, there is a New South Wales Teach Meet being run by Simon Harper coming up really soon, June 16th, 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, that's They're looking for presenters and speakers, so you can sign up for that using the link there, which is also in the description 
I believe, if I've done my job properly. If it's not, I'll add it very shortly. Uh, we've got Teach Meet 5 lined up already, which is all about agency. So George might like to do a double act and join us there about striking the balance for students, teachers and leaders. So agency as a broad concept, we're looking for presenters and attendees both. Teach Meet 6 is creating curiosity through STEM, STEAM, arts and visual design, which is on August the 12th, 7.30 till 8.30 p.m. online. So we've got lots of events coming up. If you want to run your own event, just contact myself or anyone on the call. I'm sure they'd be happy to point you in the right direction of how you go about doing one. Uh, the entire point is that it's democratic and open. And anyone can do the things we are doing right now. So with that being said, I'm going to bring this to a close. I'd like to thank especially everyone who gave up their time well into the evening to join us. And it's been lovely. And thank you very much, everyone, for your time. So, Thanks, Stephen. Good evening and good night. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for the 50 who hung around with us. Thanks, Stephen. Good, good night. night.